Hey everyone, welcome to the Warrior Kings podcast where we cover mindset, masculinity, and marriage. Today I have a very special guest. His name is Alex Party, and he is the guy you need to call if you're about to have a divorce. When your relationship is on the rocks, being threatened with divorce, this guy specializes in saving marriages and preventing divorce. Uh, we go back and forth on conflict resolution. I learn a lot from him. He learns some stuff from me too, and we are now actually working on a joint uh, little offer together. So things are exciting for the future because we realize both of us are helping men just at different stages for conflict resolution, learning how to speak to your spouse in a way that both of you can understand, help prevent arguments, etc. Let's get into it. It's fun to be connecting with you on uh, marriages and, 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 you know, relationships and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's really cool to be connecting with someone, someone else in the space. So thanks for, you know, thinking of this and, and for getting on with me. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. And you as well. Like I, and I was telling you, um, yesterday, I, was, I have great respect for what you do, especially cause you're, you're the, the clutch player when the marriage needs it. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> like you're the MJ in, in the last 30 seconds and they're down by two. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just thinking about how to put it and, one of the things that came to mind is that the night is always darkest before dawn. Mm. And, you know, that, that also works in, in relationships. And so things can seem darkest right before they get better. And I, I'm the guy that leads you through dawn mm. and you're the guy, it sounds like that leads people through the day. Yeah. yeah I think so. Make sure you don't get lost and starve in the desert. It's kind of <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> the main thing. Um, Awesome. Well, once again, glad to have you here. And I'm also happy that you're willing to connect because not, you know, people in even just neighboring niches sometimes don't want anything to do with anyone else in that space. Yeah. So I think it's awesome that you're willing to come on. And after talking with you yesterday, I have uh, a lot more, like I had respect for you and then I learned what you did and I was like, holy cow, this guy's on a different level. So <laughs> <laughs> the things you do Same here, are man. really awesome. Um, Thank you. What I wanted to get into, and I, I saved this specifically for today, was kind of uh, your origin story and like where you, where you came from and then how kind of take me through the path of how you got to this, uh, where you are now. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of a meandering path. I didn't set out thinking I'm going to help guys who are in a rocky place mm. with their wives to prevent divorce. I actually got into this because a few years ago, I was I was bedridden at one point with an illness, and uh, in that whole process of getting better, I, for the first time in my life, this was during university, for the first time in my life, I actually started to ask myself, what is it that I wanted to do with my life? And, you know, because I'd been on that whole, like, school rat race, where it's like, you go to go go through high school. You go through high school just to get into college, yeah. and then you start college, and you don't even think of where it is that you want to go. You yeah. just get your major, do internships, and go. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but that time of getting better actually gave me the time to think about what I wanted to do. And one of the big problems that uh, I saw out there was that people don't really know how to communicate well. And I saw this mainly with students going into going into the workforce out of college you know students today are so used to study guides they're used to um, being tested on prescriptive things um, and having their knowledge tested on like what's in the box what's in the realm of what's been taught okay. whereas when you get beyond uh to you know beyond university in the workplace you need to be much more creative okay. and so I ended up not going down that route because students right out of college tend to not have that much money. So, <laughs> um, uh, but the, what I found is that the same, the same principles and skill set applied to people who were in conflict situations. Okay. You know, most people aren't taught how to, uh, defuse conflict, how to disarm someone's resentment towards you. Okay. They're not taught how to approach a conflict. They're not taught how to listen. Like these are all interpersonal skills that are hugely studied now. 
mm. right? And for probably the first time in 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 history to this level. Yeah. But nobody's actually learning it. And so having that and started to help people through conflict and uh you know prevent breakups of different kinds, prevent a divorce, I realized that um a few things kind of clicked into place. One was that uh, there are certain people who are much better at, who are much more coachable and mm. therefore much better at just like learning skills on the fly and implementing them okay. to be able to achieve an outcome. And typically the people with that kind of mindset are entrepreneurs who need to learn all the skills they need to do to master business, sales, the psychology of sales, the psychology of marketing, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and the other component to that was that the people who achieve the best results tend to be the ones who have the, the biggest problem that's looming right in their face that are also, that they also like, have no alternative like they are totally unwilling to accept the uh, alternative of breakup or of divorce okay um so that's kind of how i got into it it also really uh satisfies the fact that my parents got divorced a few years ago so uh there's that component as well where i feel like i'm i'm kind of saving the thing i couldn't save right Oh uh, um, yeah. Yeah. So but we, we can go into that as well, but that's kind of the origin story. You're like, I said, it was very meandering, but that's how I wound up on this, on this path for, yeah. For conflict resolution. Yeah. Um, so just to touch back when you were in university, you noticed this problem originally, and then you're like, you were thinking, Oh, I can help these guys, but no one here has money. So this is obviously like, is in the, something I can do like full time because, <laughs> because right. you need money right. to live. Um, right. That was, right. that was when you initially had the idea. Yeah. While I, okay. well, technically while I was away from university getting better from this illness that I had. Mm. Do you, do you know the specific time or like the, the, was there a specific moment where it clicked when it was just like, you know what? A lot of these people in school just don't have the skill. To <laughs> yeah. I, I read a book on, um, I read it. There's a book, there's literature out there on what the, what the missing skill sets are from people who are, um, entering the workforce. Okay. That's so that yeah. was the original group of people that I wanted to help. Okay. Do you, do you know the name of the book or you know, care to share? Or? I, I can't find it right now. It's all good. That happens to me sometimes. <laughs> it's like, I know, I know exactly what it's called or like what, the, what all of it's about, but I just don't know the title. Yeah. <laughs> I think you might, or maybe it's because you're like, so personally, I, there's a lot of things that I don't know the origin of because as I'm reading information, the, I'm only assimilating what I could be using in my life. I don't know if you're the, the same way. So like, for example, biology is something I was never good at because it's like, I don't need to know the seven names of a cat. Mm -hmm. Like that, right. <laughs> that turned into what I'm doing in life. Um, or there's other stuff where it's like, I learned, for example, visualization and, uh, I know the name of the book just cause I read it a bunch of times, but I don't know the science of like in your mind, brain anatomy of like what's going on when you're visualizing, but I just know visualization application is effective. And so, right. Right. It's kind of like that. Or I, I don't, I don't know what the name of the thing is called. I just know it works at least it works right. in my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's that book that you were, that you learned about visualization? That sounds great. Um, the first one was thinking body dancing mind. Uh, it's a book written specifically for athletes and for, uh, they did it for business, but I read it when I was like 16. And so that business part, I kind of just glanced over, uh, but it, yeah, it specifically for, uh, for athletes. And it taught a really Eastern way of thinking about sports, which I thought aligned more logically than, uh, Western style. So I resonated with that a little bit more. Oh, cool. Cool. What was the, you know, can you give me the punchline of it? Like what? Um, well, so overall, I guess the difference between Eastern and Western philosophies is like eastern is your focus on constant progress regardless of outcome yeah. and then western is like win at all costs like tell digging nights if you're not first you're last kind of mentality i don't know if you've have you watched that or gotcha not. no 
Oh, it, it's a, it's like a real, you're going to lose some brain cells if you watch it, but it's hilarious to watch. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's about a NASCAR driver and essentially his whole life goal is like, if you ain't, if you're not the first, you're last. And so it's his whole comedic struggle of trying to deal with that. Um, but yeah, there's uh, this, it, it gave a kind of a difference between those two and I aligned more so with the progress side of things like constant progress over time. And like, if you think about it, a masterpiece painting it's done by a bunch of small details done well right um so if you focus on the small details and the progress the byproduct is you win uh, and then the visualization part was essentially like uh, if you were to this is kind of a like my previous expertise was like taekwondo and all this athlete stuff and so yeah. one of the big things that got me in the book was like your mind doesn't distinguish between what's in the mind and what's real like what you perceive to be okay. real in the external world so if you were to imagine um, taking a lemon wedge and like biting into it and then all the lemon juice going around your gums and your tongue like you salivate as if you're mm -hmm. actually doing it it's because your mind can't tell the difference between the two and so the essential part of the book is if you visualize the parts of your sport or game that you need to go well or you visualize for example uh, let's say you have a hard time when a ref makes a bad call and you just get super pissed um, but you can't do that because now the ref doesn't like you and then you're right. also off emotional balance so it's like not you don't play as good if you visualize a call going badly and then you're responding well then you're like rewiring the circuits in your brain to see when a call doesn't go well this is what to do and so instead of having to wait for a game to do that you can rehearse that 50 100 150 times in your brain and that way it's like rewired faster that's awesome uh, and then you can do that with techniques also like uh, I'm practicing kicking someone in the face with my front leg the first time I landed actually was after visualizing a bunch of times I didn't really practice it that much in training and then the guy came in and bah, it just came up I got him I was like oh it works <laughs> wow that's amazing yeah um, thanks that was uh that's what I was doing before before all this stuff yeah that reminds me also of um Michael Jordan, right? Yeah. Or Kobe. I can't remember if it was Michael Jordan or Kobe. They, they would say that they threw the most free throws in their own minds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, probably because... similar, similar concept. Yeah. And then, yeah, if you're always imagining the game, then your brain's rehearsing what to do like all the time. So, right. Right. Anyway, that's, that was that book. <laughs> cool. Cool. But if, did you, I know you were ill in university. Did you, before that, just, uh, just out of curiosity, did you do sports also? Like you're, you seem like a pretty fit guy. I played soccer growing up. Um, which, which position? Uh, striker or oh, okay. left wing. I played and... a sweeper. Oh, nice. Yeah, I played two years, but not as cool as striker. <laughs> <laughs> not as not as much glory. Yeah, <laughs> I saved um, the goal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just I no, I've I've I played soccer. I used to sail a lot as well. Oh, um, yeah, like, sailing's a lot of fun. With the whole, um, right? I don't know what the terms are called, but essentially, were you on a team or was it just you doing the boat by yourself? Uh, no, I was, it was usually two man dinghies. Okay. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's mm. a lot. It's a very, uh, it's very skill based, but it's also very kind of intellectual in the sense that you really need to always be observing the wind. Mm. You need to know where you're obviously where your target is, but, um, the wind conditions change. You need to know kind of what you're doing. Okay. Um, it's, it's very, it's fun. It's really fun. Mm. It does. I've been sailing one time with my boss and he, uh, or with my former boss and he just told me literally what to do. Cause I was like, I, I don't know what to do. So we would be like out there. He's like, okay, we're going to switch. And as soon as you grab the wheel, you need to turn as hard to left as you can until it goes and hold it there. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so that was, a, that was like a, that's my extent of sailing, but it was a lot of fun. And, um, I was like, because there's two of you, are you guys racing? Was that the, was that it or you guys just yeah so see so we we do regattas um and it, we'd race against other other dinghies what's it yeah, other boats can you just a dinghy is basically like... yeah a dinghy is basically um it sounds not that glamorous but it's basically the word for a small non-motorized boat is that the one where it's like there's there's almost like two little rafts and a net in the middle and there's a sail and you guys are like 
half sideways sometimes in the wind? No, that's a that's a catamaran. Okay, that's different. Sorry, I... a catamaran. Yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> a catamaran has two hulls. Okay. Two hulls. Uh, mm-hmm. I would only sail on mono hull dinghies. Okay. So, and specifically, I'd sail on something called a skiff. So, a skiff is short for sailing, keeping it flat and fast. Mm. So, in the past, you know, you used to see these very old archaic boats. They always used to be on a slant, or okay. like the the catamaran that you were talking about, or one yeah. hull is out of the water. Mm. These these boats they go their fastest when they're completely flat. Okay. And what they basically do is once they reach a certain speed, the wake, they actually ride their own wake. So they're sped up by their own wake. Oh, um, okay. the physics are very cool. Very yeah. cool. Um, yeah. I don't know how we got on the sailing. But... I don't know either actually, but that was pretty cool to interest. That was interesting to, to learn about. Um, okay. So let's, let's, let's go back to where we were at. We were, um, you saw the, you wanted to help men in conflict resolution because there are a lot of interpersonal skills that people just don't leave university with. And it's not even taught, which I would agree with actually, because a lot of that stuff isn't taught. I learned public speaking with no conflict resolution, which I, I think would probably be a, I'm going to use conflict resolution a lot more than I'm going to use public speaking. Like I've given, I think exactly <laughs> one presentation in my few years of working and I've had to resolve a lot of conflicts and luckily um, I learned a little bit, about, a little a bit about it before I got in there, but there's some people who, who don't. <laughs> yeah. Um, so on that note, like you mentioned your, um, your parents divorce and you mentioned to me the other day that that happened a few years ago or really recently or yeah. Yeah. It happened in adulthood. So it happened, uh, it started a few years, years ago and finished up a couple of years ago. Okay. The interesting thing about that was that I, I was kind of already learning the skills that I'm now applying in my business while okay. I was growing up mm-hmm. because my parents, the writing was on the wall for their divorce way before they, they would, there was a lot of conflict in the house. And when I would kind of get involved and be like, look, mom, dad means this. And look, dad, mom means this. Mm -hmm. They'd be like, Oh, (laughs) (laughs) um, and they, and then that fight would kind of be resolved. But when I left for college, uh, things kind of went downhill. You after weren't there that. to mediate it anymore. Right. I see. But I always had this kind of, this, I guess, uh, propensity to being able to understand differing viewpoints, differing uh, uh, opinions without necessarily agreeing with them. And that's, that's kind of what gets into the the art of what I do with my clients is I teach them to under, show understanding of a point of view without agreeing with a point of view, oh, which is, that's really good. That's much harder than people think. Um, it's, it becomes a bit of an art, a bit of a game actually. Uh, if you try to keep it kind of lighthearted for yourself. Not that conflict is a game or that it's fun at all, but, mm-hmm. um, if you pose as that, pose it as that challenge, then, um, it can be easier to, to kind of get there. Okay. So teach understanding without agreeing. Um, just cause I'm genuinely like, like really curious about that. What's an example of how you would execute that? Cause there's, there's times where I think I do that, but I don't know if I'm doing it right. Yeah. <laughs> This is a gotcha. Good idea. Well, essentially what you're doing to, to show that you understand someone's point of view without agreeing, mm. uh, they basically need to have some kind of confirmation on your part that you've understood, right? That so, and the only way that you can do that is by repeating back to them what they've said to you, but in your own words. Okay. And oh. the other component the other component that comes in with that is making sure that you're accurately uh, that you're accurately labeling their emotions. Mm. Okay, that makes sense. So essentially, it'd be 
between the two, in my experience, I think generally labeling the emotion would come first, and then, and then you surmise their. Well, this, well, actually, let me think about that. In a situation where I don't agree. <laughs> in a situation where I don't agree, I think the my standard operating procedure, my SOP, would be to um, label their emotion until I feel like the emotion has been fully validated, I guess. And then after that, then I'll try and surmise their point back to them. Or mm -hmm. summarize their point back to them. And then that's, I think, then at least they feel not only emotionally understood, but logically understood. And then if I still give a uh let's say i need to give a suggestion because a lot of times people are talking and they don't want suggestions but in case i do need to give a suggestion because it's work or whatever then i'd give a suggestion and i think they're generally they're more receptive to receiving it because it's like they fully understand my point and they still believe this is kind of exactly okay yeah that's it that's that's more or less the the framework i think it, when it comes to you know when you're at work with someone and, and there's kind of something going on there the stakes typically aren't as high oh yeah as yeah, is, when deadlines tuesday versus wednesday versus half my stuff <laughs> right right um so like in an example of you know two uh, a married couple who need to resolve. see things who yeah who need to resolve who need to talk things out mm -hmm. that process can be hours long sometimes Mm. Um, okay. I've, you know, I've personally had to either sit there and, and really actively listen with my partner. Um, I've also had to do this with, I've, I've even had to do this with clients who had such an emotional buildup that they needed to vent out before they were actually be receptive to techniques. Yeah. So once this one time, I remember I actually had to sit there label, uh, repeat back what was being said, label again, repeat back and do that whole process. It took me like three hours, Holy cow. but you know, most people wouldn't, wouldn't go through a kind of exploratory session. Most, uh, how do I put it? Most people who work with others wouldn't take that kind of time. Yeah. Cause that's what time. <laughs> as soon as you, as soon as I did that, as soon as there was nothing else to clear out, mm -hmm. right. That person was able to assimilate everything I, I could teach in 45 minutes to an hour okay. and then implement, implement it immediately because they had no emotional barrier preventing them from absorbing and okay. from being willing to implement, right? Cause that's mm. the other thing is like you learn the techniques and then you go to implement. And so often you can get in your own way because you can be triggered by what she said. You can get annoyed at what she said and, mm. and your ego gets in the way because you need to, you get the, you get that need to feel vindicated somehow yeah, or to okay. set the record straight somehow. Mm. Like and and that right. will just, yeah, exactly. Mm. They need to be right. And so, that can get in the way. Um, but you know, since I did my job correctly, that client was able to go on and, and just change the whole situation. Wow. That's a, that's a really impressive feat to, to listen for, for that long and label it. And then, and then they're able to implement it too, which is also the really important part because even if they vent to you and they don't change anything, then <laughs> they're in the same situation. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Uh, Okay, must be met. That's really cool. Um, and then you said currently your partner. Are you dating, or are you planning to get married soon, or what's the situation? Well, your current, uh, current personal situation. Yeah, so I've been with my current girlfriend for almost five years now. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, as far as I know, the plan is to you know get married at some point and and start a family. Yeah. We're not there yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we have a few years before we'll probably hit that mark, but yeah, I think five years in, we both feel pretty committed, confident. Um, yeah, I mean, we talk about it, so, mm. you know, it's, okay. So it's, yes, it's, it's, it's on, it's in the plan in the future. Yeah. Okay. For sure. Yeah. So I have a question that I'm pretty sure, uh, the audience will have is, so you're a guy who coaches people who are about to have a divorce but right. you're also not married yet. And then you're also a younger looking guy. So right. I'm sure some of them are asking like, 
what are the uh, what are the credentials or what what would qualify you to to coach this situation? Yeah, uh, that's a really justified question because you know why would you want to work with me, <laughs> right? Like why why would someone want to trust me with their conflict situation? And what I'll say to that is. Number one, I have a track record for preventing breakups and preventing divorce. Um, personally, to me, so, like, it sounds like you've already worked with a bunch of people and there's there's results. And for me, I like care about I personally all I care about are results. So it looks like you're getting right. results. So on my books, you're like, <laughs> you're good. But for yeah. what else, we can keep going. <laughs> um, yeah. So thanks. Exactly. So I think the results are the most important thing. They speak for themselves. I think second the second part to this is I actually, you know, being really straight up and honest, mm. I, you know, when you have two parents who don't listen to each other and who didn't know how to resolve conflict, it's very easy to repeat those kinds of patterns. Yes. Like generation. And kind of. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Or just learned behavior, right? Like you, yeah. you imitate, you imitate your parents a lot because yeah. that's kind of what you, that's how, that's how you see how to be in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that having learned those patterns has definitely come very, has made me come very close to breaking up with my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Um, so what I can say is I think we've come close to breaking up twice in the five years that we've been together. And it was these techniques that actually saved me from the breakup mm. because it's so like, I, I have to practice what I preach. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and they only work if there's like, a 100% committedness to staying together mm -hmm. and having actually gone through that, having come close to break up, having seen how these techniques can literally turn a situation around very quickly. Even if you've, even if you've not been so diligent at using them in the first place to, and gotten you to that point, that's close to break up, mm -hmm. like they, they work, right. Mm -hmm. They, they work, they work in life or death situations. Like these techniques are not techniques I've made up. I've learned these. Yeah. I've kind of brought in a bunch of techniques together and how do I put it? Like synthesized a bunch of stuff together. And yeah. they're all usually techniques that come from life or death situations. So yeah, um, there's that. And I think the last, the last piece I'd, I'd add to that is, you know, my parents, my parents got divorced and it, and it has sucked since, right? It's just been, but, but like between the fam, between the drama, between like having to watch out of what shit gets thrown your way from one of your parents, mm -hmm. um, it, it also is like very difficult in the sense of like, you got to spend one, All day. one life. Yeah. One with one, one with the other, um, it's just, it's a real killer on your quality of life and on your stability because, you know, you don't, you have to go to two different homes mm -hmm. for, for, for just to see your parents. Right. Um, it's more planning, it's harder. So I have a, I have a real vested interest in, and in compassion when wanting to keep families together more so than for the couples, but for their kids, like mm, yeah. it's, it's much, it's, I'm doing it not so much for them. Well, I'm doing it for them obviously, but I'm doing it even more for their kids because it's, they don't realize how bad it is That's or can be mm. yeah, for their kids. So, yeah. Okay. So what would you say for, to the comments or the people in the comment sections of Instagram posts who are like, essentially pro-divorce and they're saying stuff like, Oh, I'm so glad my parents uh, split up or divorced because it's a, it was a really toxic situation for me at home as a kid. Like what's your, what's your take on that? Yeah. So 
that's a very nuanced thing. And there are a few, there are, there are multiple levels of answers there. So I think the first, the first face value answer is it sounds like the person who said that was going through hell as a child and that gave them relief. So, so that's valid. And like that needed, that was obviously in that situation, probably the best kind of band-aid situation on, okay, stopping conflict. But I think that like, if we take it a step further, the next question is why were these people fighting? Right. Yeah. And so are they fighting because there's some emotional wounding and there is, you know, that one of, one of the parents or both of the parents are, kind of propagating negative behaviors or toxic kinds of behaviors. So then it's an emo- a question of emotional wounding. Uh, does the person have a short temper? Are they stressed? Um, are, you know, is, is their system kind of, and their, and their physiology, is it not really very strong to be able to handle stress? And are they acting out? That's another question. And, the third part to that is like, what are they doing about it? Because most people in those situations or who end up divorcing, they just get stuck in this cycle of arguing and they just, they constantly do the same thing, expecting an, a different outcome and never actually like take a step back and are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like what is happening here? Or even if they do do that, because a lot of people do that and they still don't manage. And, you know, I'm not here to to make anybody feel bad about themselves. But if they have stepped back, did they actually get at the root cause? And I think that that's a, that's a really important thing to know. That, like, communication skills can prevent uh, a breakup because what they do is they basically increase compassion. Okay. So compassion being the understanding of suffering. When you understand someone's suffering, when there is understanding of suffering, there is, that brings peace. It brings more love. It brings um, all these kinds of different things. So, and this is kind of why I say like, I am what, what I said at the beginning, whereas like the night is darkest before dawn and I'm, and I'm the guide through the dawn. So, because, you know, just cause I guide you away from the night, just cause I guide you into the day, doesn't mean I guide you through the day. I, pr- I help stop the divorce. I help stop the breakup. But then what happens after that, there needs to be some level of healing, some level of personal responsibility and accountability to heal the situation. So um, that's kind of how I look at it. And then I think the last thing is so that we had the face value answer. We had the question on why are people fighting? And I think the answer to that is, uh, you know, we resolve that with bringing in compassion, what I, what I call applied compassion. So uh, starting bringing in uh, communication skills and, and, showing people understanding is already uh, the beginning of showing compassion. And then, then obviously taking that, that to the next level uh, with more like what you do is kind of that next step. But then the last, the last answer to that is some people, some people maybe got into their relationships for the wrong reasons. Um, also true. Like... And, and sometimes some people just, are, yeah, maybe selfish reasons, or maybe they're just not kind of meant to be together. Um, but I, I'm always a believer in where there's a will, there's a way. And, yeah. and, I, and that's also why like, I, I never take on any client who has divorce in the back of his mind, like as a, as a, as a potential plan B. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. That's actually, that's interesting that that's part of your vetting process. Cause if, if there's a, there's a plan B, then they're not going to give plan a hundred right it's just it's just not it's just not the it it doesn't yeah it doesn't guarantee a good result for the person because they already have an escape-based mindset so yeah yeah i think that's something that um personally for my wife and i like neither of us both of us are like uh call them cradle catholics we were raised catholic essentially since birth so many of those 
uh, ingrained in us. And we thought it over and we, after, for personally, I, like I drifted away from the church, I came back. For, per, for both of us, it's like divorce is not on the table at all. So it's, right. we can get really upset with each other and granted, cause I have better personal skills now. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I'm better at maintaining the marriage at a, at a, at a good level. Uh, but yeah, both of us came in with the understanding, like there's no divorce on the table. That's just, that's just the way it was. So I think that's a big, big factor. Um, there's an interesting kind of during my research, there's an interesting statistic that came out. I think it was in 2019 where of the, uh, couples who got divorced, uh, just let me know what you think about this, given your, your experience yeah. of couples who got divorced, they broke it down by, um, by demographic and what the, the demographic with the least amount of divorce was actually Asians. Um, really? Uh, yeah, I think it was like 13%. It was like really small compared to all the other, um, all the other ones. And I, I sat and I thought about that for a little bit. And I don't know if it's because like in Asian culture, it's very uncommon to have a fight in front of guests at all. And so like, for example, in the Catholic church, if you have a fight with your spouse, you're supposed to solve it behind closed doors. And then same thing with mm. Asian culture is the same thing where it's like, if you have, if a fight breaks out, let's say we're all at friends, we're all having dinner as friends and a fight between a couple breaks out, like between friends, it's like, that means it's gone really bad already for it to happen in a public setting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering what your thoughts are on like, um, if a married couple fighting behind closed doors versus like in front of kids or. Because it sounds like in your situation, it was it was in front of you a little bit because you had to mediate. Well, I was wondering what your thoughts are around that. Um, my only thoughts on that are what it, what's the example that you're setting for the kids? Okay, right. So ultimately, your kids imitate you in more ways than you realize. Oh yeah. And not now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm sure I will gain, you know, more confirmation of this, of this knowledge than I currently do, but I, I've seen it so much in myself. So I think the, I think the behind closed doors thing is, I think it's important. I think it's um, important to, uh, I think it's important to not be fake, right? Okay. And so, like, like you know, if things aren't well with your spouse, uh, you know, and you can't hold in the kind of lack of exuberance with, with with them in front of other people, like, I don't think that's wrong just because that's how you feel, right? But I do think that I do, I, I yeah, I definitely wouldn't, ever suggest like fighting in front of other people just because it's it brings in a level of shame that you didn't have before fighting in front of other people when you not? fight okay yeah. okay yeah when you fight in front of other people you know it's very easy for you and or your partner to feel ashamed of the fact that you know you you kind of publicize this issue um i do believe i do believe in in privacy and settling matters privately absolutely um so i do think that like if you can handle things behind closed doors that's better are you referring to like therapy now or are you just referring to like friends and family kids oh um like let's say like not really like therapy that wasn't that wasn't the um what i mean oh, okay like behind closed doors like let's say uh let's say for example like hypothetically speaking my wife did something while i was out or while we were out with friends that like really bothered me it's mm -hmm. not something where i would correct there i would like wait till we were in the car on the way home where it's just us so i'm not correcting in front of yeah. people like that kind of that kind of deal oh yeah that's definitely way way better um and vice versa should should do the same for me right that's absolutely better than than trying to correct it out in public it's not the setting for it people don't receive it well yeah okay 
Oh, actually, just thinking about that, when you were talking about it now, uh, my mind was, after I said it aloud, my mind was wandering out a little bit more. Um, and also because you introduced that shame factor, I was thinking maybe the reason that it's beneficial to do that is because it forces you to pause because you literally cannot address it right then. You have to address mm -hmm. it later. So there's like a literal pause between when it happened and then when you're going to address it. So that allows for like the respond versus react situation. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe that's what it is. That's definitely part of it. Um, actually, th this is really a question of timing, right? Okay. What's okay. the right time to raise an issue? And it's something that I go through with my clients, right? So okay. uh, public is definitely not a good time to raise an issue or try to sort something out uh, because of the pressure of, like, needing to uh, keep face. Yeah, and keep face. Right. Yeah. Um, and then there's the, then there's the, uh, the, the timing elements of like, what are going on in you, what's going on in your lives? Like having a, a really difficult conversation at the end of a long day or long week is probably <laughs> not the best idea. Right. Um, so what I typically advise my clients to do is be like, look, pick a time where you guys are relaxed, where you're relaxed, where she's more likely to be relaxed because what you you're basically trying to do is you're trying to up the probability of the conversation going well. And timing is one of the variables in that equation. Um, okay. So that can be, you know, there are certain times of the year where the timing is kind of off to have a conversation like the holidays or, you know, if you're staying with parents or something like that, that's one aspect. Then there's like monthly cadences. There's, um, do you, are you selling a lot at the end uh, and you need to finish your sales quota at the end of the month or, you know, there's, there's lots of different variables, uh, in people's personal lives on what, when timing it tends to be better. Yeah. But what I invite my clients to do is to really like, look at them, look at all of the variables and decide, okay, when's the best time. The other, the other, the last thing I'll say to that is like the timing, the time that is the wrong time is when someone brings a problem to you. So, uh, like, yeah, that's always the wrong time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So like if, if someone says, Hey, I'm annoyed about something and you're like, yeah, yeah. Okay. That we, that's fine. I get it. I'm sorry. Look, I really want to get this, get this lesson out of this conversation before the conversation has kind of passed. That's, that's like a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Okay. Makes it, that's a part of the thing where you see online where it's like when someone brings up something, adding on all these little issues. And... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's really cool, man. Um, but yeah, that's just something I, was, I, was, I kind of always wondered because a friend of mine brought me that stat and I was like, I wonder why that would, for, for Asians anyway, like, I wonder why that would be the case. But timing definitely is also an important factor. That personally is something like I just weigh and measure on my own, but I get that's that's a good um, he wants a variable to keep aware of for sure. Would you say for conflict resolution, like what would be the top six fundamentals? Because every I, I, I keep top six because generally for each sport, there's like six fundamentals. If you get good at these fundamentals, you're going to be good at the sport. Like, what would you be your top six fundamentals for uh, conflict resolution? Oh, the top six fundamentals. It doesn't have to be six, but somewhere generally around six is where. Sure. Yeah, that's what like dribbling, shooting, passing, like, <laughs> like that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the first element I'd say is tone of voice. Oh, good one. That's not that's the very, very uh, that's not addressed very often. It's the hardest one to control. Um, so we can we can explore that more, but I'll say that because the tone of voice is is huge, right? And so um, it's the actually it's the highest leverage thing that you can use. Okay. The highest leverage uh, element or technique or skill that you can use in in a conflict situation. It's the highest leverage one. The next, um, the next piece I'd say is self-restraint. 
So it's very easy to lose your cool okay. when when conflict arises and if you can restrain yourself and be the one to do the listening before you do the talking or accusing or whatever it is you want to do you're you may never even get to the fight yeah actually yeah because so they feel cool and then you're like well i don't need to respond to this so <laughs> yeah <laughs> gonna go about our day exactly yeah so self-restraint or self-discipline. Uh, the third, the third thing I'd say is active listening techniques. So these are like the formulaic expressions that you can use to and 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 kind of strategy to start to disarm someone's emotional state. Uh, looks like it seems like it feels like yeah yeah i wouldn't i would never say, i wouldn't say it's it feels like um because feeling is personal but so that's not a that's not a word i i typically advise my clients to to use okay. uh but yeah like what you're saying it seems like it sounds like like it looks like and then using you know really being able to hone in and, and you know there's th these techniques were really kind of explained well by chris voss's book never split the difference and he is what that's an excellent book i, I re highly recommend for anyone who has not ever yeah. read that book to read that book yeah absolutely it's it's an incredible book easy to read he <laughs> yeah it's a very fun read yeah it's like oh there's a hostage how does he get did he get him out yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah. um but he calls it tactical empathy mm -hmm. and i think when it comes to which makes absolute sense in the world of Hostage. hostage negotiation yeah. and also business oh, yeah. um, you know, in the, in the business world. <laughs> right. But I, I don't, I don't like that um, for a relationship. I don't like that kind of verbiage. I don't like the, the, the impulse it gives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or even empathy, because again, I, I like to bring it back to compassion Okay. What? Compassion being. Oh, good. I was gonna say. Well, I was gonna go ask, ahead. No, you. I was gonna ask. What, what's, what's the, the difference? difference? Yeah, for you, what's the difference between the two? Yeah. So empathy is just the the ability to see someone else's point of view. Okay. Right. Okay. Where in a conflict situation, you are you're beyond points of views. You are actually like struggling and suffering with something that the other person is doing. Okay. And so the compassion is literally the understanding of the suffering. Okay. Because that, that is, that is critical. The compassion piece is critical for like the actual healing out of the situation. Okay. Because it's at some point when it comes to personal conflict, there's an, a, there's a level of tr broken trust. There's a, le a level of emotional hurt. There's a level of uh, frustration, anger, all these different, very highly charged emotions that are usually, you know, like in a business setting, it can, it can like kind of build over time, but it's usually, it's not as deep seated as a relationship issue. Like those emotions run really deep and they often, as we, as I was mentioning before, they can tug at trauma from the past. Okay. Right. Yeah. So compassion is what is the, is the kind of first, uh, you got to kind of embody that living essence of compassion to initiate the healing process. Okay. I think I'm following. And then I guess what would be the steps in, uh, the healing so, so we were going through the like six critical pieces. So again, 
starting off with tone of voice, okay, hat practicing self discipline, learning how to like re listening techniques because people feel so much relief if just to start off with from their emotional pain if you've actively and accurately showed them that you understand their their suffering their struggle or what it is that they're upset about okay so that's that's one that's sorry that's the first three uh what else do you need to master i'd say timing is a big one timing yeah T- timing is number four <laughs> and it matters if your timing is like oh we're traveling for the holidays and there's a or plane or flights delayed hey you know what about that <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Okay. And then let's see, five and six. What are five and six? If there's really four, I mean we could keep it at four. It doesn't have to be six, but just generally six. No, I think I think I would I think I'll add uh one more. And that is um really understanding reciprocity. So so one of the things I've seen in many couples is this kind of attitude to give up on giving when yeah. someone feels like they're not receiving. Yeah, that um, I see that a lot. And that kind of, it, it's, I mean, you can call it petty, you can call it whatever you want, but ultimately it's, it's a negative sum game because you're, you're basically like you're running a race to the first one who can give the least. Yes. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. So that attitude, it just means, okay, if she's not going to give me this, then I'm not, not going to give her that. And then she's like, he's yeah. not doing that. So I'm going to take this away. And then eventually neither of you are doing anything. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, reciprocity is a huge uh, component that is really missing in in people who are close to divorce. Yeah, because it's it also seems like they've been playing that game for a while too. Yeah, it can be. Must be a game. Yeah, that's a good list to to make sure that well to give yourself and your your partner the best chance of getting out of that for sure. That's oh, yeah. <laughs> very comprehensive. Yeah. Coming out from your background, one of, one thing I did want to mention though was like something Ray Dalio had said was, do you know uh, Ray Dalio is like the hedge fund manager guy? I'm not sure if you. Yeah, yeah, I know Ray Dalio. Um, I read his book Principles, and what was interesting, and when you had said you had, when you're giving these testimonials of all of these men you've helped, one of the principles that Ray Dalio has is he doesn't take advice from anyone who has either he doesn't take advice from. Or in order for, sorry, I guess to phrase it this way. Have you read Principles before? Like, I might be preaching the choir already. I have, yeah. It's a great book. Okay. Um, but for those of you who haven't read Principles because it's like 400 or 500 pages of text, <laughs> essentially, uh, Ray Dalio is uh, a hedge fund manager. And I think I believe he had, he got his hedge fund so big that where if he had traded in the market, the market moved. I remember that him, him mentioning that somewhere in the book, That's which so I thought wild. was impressive because I was like, I, at the time I was reading, I was like, I was just finishing forex trading. Like I just kind of stopped, and I was like, "That's that's an incredible amount of money to where if you trade something, the whole market shifts price because you're that's a big win." Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so yeah. Ray Dalio is this guy, and for him, everything is a system. So for him to have take to take someone's advice, the person has to have either produced the result themselves three times and be able to explain the reasoning and how they did it, or they have had to have someone else produce the result or coach someone else to produce the result three times and be able to explain it. And for you, Alex, like you have the, you've definitely done that, which is fantastic. Right. Like, and, and not only have you done it a couple of times, you can explain why and how. So I think that's, that's incredible. And it's, um, that's to, to be able to systemize your approach for a standard operating procedure essentially is, um, takes a great level of awareness and, so let's say good job man. thanks man <laughs> yeah thank you that's yeah it's really incredible 
I appreciate that. Um, yeah, but I, I, I kind of want to shift gears a little bit and I want to hear, you know, how, how you got into this, how you work with clients, like what, what is it that you do? Cause I, I only work with the crisis situation. Like pr- I prevent the divorce, like right at that moment, yeah. but then I, you know, then the client is free to do something else, but it sounds like you kind of pick up where my work finishes. Yeah. In, in a way that's, uh, that was, yeah, that was really interesting when we talked and we got really specific on who we're trying to help. I was like, that's cool. Cause that's an area I don't, I don't touch. Usually at that point, it's like, you need a specialist. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna start it straight to you. Actually, that's that's the way to do it. Um, Thanks, bud. I guess the the origin story. Yeah, the origin story essentially is um, before I was doing this work, I was a professional athlete. Um, I did taekwondo. Well, I've been doing taekwondo since I was four, and then I stopped when I was 29, and I'm 33 now. I essentially stopped uh, just because I got really old. Um, okay. During that time. I was dating, um, dating, uh, dating a girl and the relationship was good at first, like most relationships are cause it's honeymoon phase and then slowly steadily went downhill. And during that time I was trying to, uh, essentially approach it the way I would like Taekwondo. I was researching and going to classes and taking all this stuff online about like how, how to do it properly. And, uh, the relationship didn't end up working out. So I figured, you know, maybe, Maybe it was, uh, we're just not a good match or whatever. And then I met my current wife in the Philippines and I was like, okay, cool. So I'm going to take all that knowledge. I'm going to add on even more knowledge. And then I'm going to be the best husband I can be. And it was essentially that, um, the framework, the overarching framework of happy wife, happy life, where my wife's emotion and keeping my wife happy and solving her every whim on her whim was the way a lot of mainstream social media says to do mm-hmm. I did that and not only was um not only was i unhappy in the marriage she was also becoming stressed and unhappy because that's not like what she had asked for it's not what she signed up for that's just what i defaulted to because that's what i thought mm. that everyone had mm. wanted um and then i started researching and doing more stuff and essentially i came across i guess more old school frameworks not as like not as modern and it was essentially like you need to be the man, you need to lead the relationship and you need to be a good leader. So a lot of what I teach um, could be just generic good leadership advice, especially if like you're a boss leading a team, if you're a dad leading kids, or in my, in my case, your instructor leading students, or if you're um, a husband leading a wife or your family. Uh, and I came across all of this from the research, but also because I guess that's, that's how I stumbled into this niche. And then where I learned the skills for this was a little bit different. Growing up, I had a lot of social anxiety where I would, uh, my life was fairly simple when I was in training because I just need to kick the other dude in the face and we don't need to talk and life is good because after that I go play video games. <laughs> there's, there's zero need to interact with someone socially. And if it didn't have to do with me winning in Taekwondo, I actually didn't really care to talk about it that much. I wasn't very social in school and I had, I had a lot of social anxiety. So like it was to a point where um, I, I had a hard time even ordering food from a cashier at like McDonald's. Wow. Like, I would have to wow. like, repeat phrases in my head over and over and over again. And like my, my palms would be sweaty. Like when I ordered like number one, no, wow. and if they couldn't hear me, it sounds really hard. Yeah, it was, um, it was, and I knew that it was something I'd have to get over. And so I ended mm. up taking a sales job. Uh, you may have heard of them. Like, have you heard of Cutco knives? Yeah, 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 uh-huh. yeah. Um, I fell for the pitch because like, man, you have an awesome background in Taekwondo. We'd love to have you in here and seem like a star candidate. And I was like, sweet, <laughs> this <is a> great <laughs> gift. <laughs> um, and I'll I'll never forget. So like, we're we, we go through the training and like they're like, okay, you're gonna have to talk to your client. And I was like, okay, if there's a script though, I can just read from the script and I don't actually have to say that much. And then. Uh, my first week of sales go by, it, it, I mean, my parents are essentially the only people who bought from me. So <laughs> I go into the next training with this, uh, with the sales training uh, lady and she's doing super well. And she's like, all right, Chris, well, we want to work on you to like, you know, you're still here. You want to, we want to help you increase your sales, blah, blah, blah. So 
uh, let's, 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 let's work on it. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. And she's like, how much time do you spend building rapport with your customer? And I was like, uh, what's rapport? And she was like, oh, you know, when you ask them about your day and they respond and you tell them about your day. And then I was like, no joke. The question was like, people care about that. <laughs> she just, wow. she was so taken aback. She's like, oh my God, Chris. Yes, of course. And then she explained essentially her framework for, um, for selling was like, she tries to build as much rapport as possible. And then she'll do the presentation almost as if it's like, because she has to do the presentation, but I'm really here just to talk to you. Like that was her, gotcha. that was her framework. And I was like, okay, that's an interesting way to do it. And so, um, I did that and I learned how to build rapport. I learned, essentially I learned all these communication techniques that I thought everyone just had in their arsenal already. And so I built communication skills essentially from zero and I've just been adding on different techniques and different ways to view situations, et cetera. Um, and then now in my professional life and as I've gotten a little bit older, like this last year or two, I've been um, around other men and they'd ask offhanded questions about like, um, this is going on in my marriage. Like what, what do you think would be going on? Or I'd see like the dynamic and how they're reacting or responding to each other. It's like, Ooh, I don't know if that would have said that <laughs> like in those, in those situations. And so when those people, um, when, when those men, um, ask me for advice. It's kind of just like, this is what I would do in that situation. And I just essentially remembered all the stuff that I had to learn later in life that were techniques. A lot of the stuff was from Chris Voss, some stuff I learned from sales, the comfortability. And then a part of it also is the stuff where you have to work on yourself as a man for the, what you were saying, the, the self-restraint, um, and like the tone of voice, that stuff I really had to work on because, mm -hmm. That's that regardless of your partner is just stuff. I think you as a man should have under control. Right. Um, right. So that's a long story of how I got to where I am. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so you said a bunch of stuff in there that I, I kind of want to tease out. So basically it sounds like you really had this severe, almost crippling social anxiety. And you, the other day you mentioned, so you took a sales job. That's like the opposite of, that's like, the, that's like a social anxiety person with social anxiety is worst nightmare. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I, I took the sales job because number one, it fit in the training schedule because I was trained in, in college. I was training three times a day. And so it's like when I was trying to apply for jobs, no one's taking a guy who can work from 10 to 1230 and then four to six, like <laughs> no one's taking that dude and I needed money. So there's that. And then the second part was when I did take the job, I understood, um, I think just through Taekwondo understanding that in order to grow you're going to have to throw yourself in situations like if that, that's just how life is i think um and so i took the sales job knowing that it was going to push me and uh worst comes to worst i would make zero sales but i got to talk to people in right was was the upside <laughs> that's awesome that's a that's like a real life growth mindset like uh, thanks from that book the thinking body dancing mind <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, no, but that's super cool that you willingly put yourself in a, in a very uncomfortable situation to, to get out of this, uh, to overcome the social anxiety. And so basically, but then once you did that, it sounds like because so much of just conversation was completely foreign to you, you automatically assumed that everybody else already knew this. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, big time. Uh, I'd be going around and like, it, especially because at high in high school and like in college everyone still has like their clicks and conversation moves so fast and they know how to respond and make everyone like laugh and stuff and i was like felt like left behind essentially like i don't have a good framework or tool set to, to handle this and i mean i had like a couple of friends in high school but i really didn't talk that much it was really just like i ate my lunch about my training like later in the day and <laughs> that was it um but yeah yeah that's uh to answer your question, I knew that it was going to have to be addressed at some point and uh, better to do that. The sooner I could deal with the situation I knew was going to be bad, the better. The less it would compile, I guess. Almost like the emotional baggage you're talking about where like, if you don't address it, it just builds up and builds up until they have to have a three-hour session. Right. You. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that all makes sense. And so so... So you learned a ton and then you learned so much that you kind of overshot what most people actually 
I think. No, on average. Yeah. It, so, it, so that when it came time to, you know, be in a relationship, you already had this, uh, you had, you already had this like personal culture of studying how to make, how to make it the best it can possibly be. And it, it failed you on your first relationship and on your second relationship, basically you try, you did the same process, but you, you, you're like, okay, I need to try something new because it didn't work the first time around. And then because that knowledge set is so, so much higher, people started asking you for help because you know all this stuff. Like you really studied it deeply. Yeah. Um, I actually don't know what prompts people to ask, but for some reason they'll all offhandedly ask. And um, a, a few of Mary guys had, had requested it. And, uh, and I just thought it was just stuff that everyone knew. Like I literally just assumed everyone knew all of this stuff. So that's a very accurate way of putting it. It was like, I did overstudy to try and it, almost like to overcompensate where I thought everyone was. Um, so I learned a lot of stuff and the missing component essentially for the, the marriage, at least my experience of it and what I've the faults in other guys is essentially like mm -hmm. aiding the man in the relationship, like value systems, mm -hmm. um, who you are as a person and the, the whole, like the marriage shouldn't be catered around, um, your wife's emotion. But my wife has actually like mentioned to me, like, she's really glad it doesn't because, if it is around her emotion only, then like she's not allowed to get upset because then it means the marriage is bad or she's not allowed to have a bad day because that means the marriage is bad. And so retaining the, um, the frame of, or I guess the framework of like being the man and knowing what I teach my guys, is, I guess to break down more of my process, even though there's a lot of communication on the back end of the communication, it, I find it doesn't work as much if there's, if you as a guy aren't, building yourself or have not like the if you yourself aren't doing things that make you respect yourself does that make i don't know mm. if that makes sense so i think absolutely if uh, you should be like working out you should be studying you should be trying to provide for your family like all of this stuff kind of goes into that and i look at mm -hmm. it as that's the vehicle of the car the more of that stuff you have the more the more sturdy the car is, the safer your wife feels being in the car with you. Because if gotcha. you're, yeah, if you're missing one of those components, then she knows and you know, like, let's say you're not working out. Like she knows and you know, like this is going to come bite us down the road, like later down the right. road. And so if you're doing all the things that help keep yourself as a man intact, then your car is sturdy. But if you're just sitting in a car going nowhere, that also gets boring for both of you. And right. one of you is going to want out of the car. <laughs> After, right after a while so if uh the other part is to plot a destination for where you see your ideal marriage where you see your ideal life and then make sure that that's aligned with your wife and if it's not then you can hash out like the small details sure and as long as you're and part of the security for your wife is to know that you're taking action every day to push the gas a little bit to get closer and closer to the destination and once that's awesome uh, thank you um uh, and I found once that framework is in place, all the communication skills also that you learn on the back end of that help keep the conversation in the car a, little, a lot better as you go toward your um, dream vacation. Ideal life in 10 years to be is. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a really good analogy. The car analogy uh, is, is really good. And that makes a lot of sense around, you know, everything that you've just said makes a ton of sense. So, how in in like a short statement like how do you you know in a couple sentences like how do you frame what it is that you help men achieve i haven't the question has been posed like that before essentially what i think what i help men achieve is i help them take a marriage that they think Let's say your ideal marriage is a 10 out of 10. That's like perfect mm -hmm. in mine. I think with my frameworks, et cetera, I can take a marriage that's around maybe your four. So not, if it's a two or one, man, I'm, I gotta call you. <laughs> <laughs> two or one, I gotta call you. Uh, I, I'd take a marriage, I think that's essentially average and I bring it to around an eight or a nine. 
10 out of 10, I think, is like when you hit your ideal state, you got like you have so much money you don't know what to do with, fighting your giving back to community. Like all that stuff is nine or 10 years, but I believe I can get people to round eight. And the reason I'm able to do that, uh, number one, is because part of the curriculum or part of what I teach is I try and keep these guys accountable. So where they're constantly building areas of fitness, their relationship and in their uh, finances. And then on, to, on the back end of that, I'm making sure that they're maintaining the marriage wall because like a fit body, like your marriage also takes maintenance. And there's one, some of it, which we went over was the, the compassion part of feel, helping your spouse feel heard. And I guess this is a really long mm -hmm. answer. <laughs> I guess. No, know, it's I, yeah, true. Yeah. The, the one statement would be essentially that I take guys who are around a four in their marriage around average and i can take it to about eight the nine and ten is really stuff that you got to push on your own that's pushing your own boundaries and your own personal growth at the very top uh, for your like actualized state but i can take an average gotcha and make it gotcha pretty fucking good <laughs> gotcha so that's a really so this actually hits on another question that um has been posed to me uh, and was also a, a kind of a state of, uh, kind of like caused some insecurity in me is like, people think that the work I do is like a marriage coach. Like I help people improve their marriage, but I'm not, I don't do that. What I do is I save, I help people save relationships and prevent divorce. So people think that on the spectrum from zero to 10, I can take them all away from zero to 10. Um, and I can't, I just can take them from zero to two or three, like what you were saying. And now what I thought was, uh, that you could actually go from two or three, right. All the way up to 10. So, but it sounds like what you're saying is that that last piece, that nine to 10, right. It sounds like that's like almost like a different skill set. It might be. How Okay. So what I was going to say is like, what do you think is needed then? Or how can a coach help someone get from an eight to a 10 or from a nine to a 10? Oh, um, well, sorry. I, I think I overlooked one of my own like free frameworks. So I think in my mind, a 10 is actually almost not attainable. That's perfection already. Like, does that, does that make okay. sense? And so yeah. whenever I'm near a goal, I move the goal. Okay. No, so I guess that's that's the underlying premise. That's why I say you can take it to about eight because when you get to eight or around eight or nine, I learned that you should take your goal and move it because if you hit the goal, then you tend to like slack, dip, dip, and in order to keep yourself pushing and on the grind mode so you don't lose all the progress you've made, if you continuously move the goal back, you essentially gaslight yourself. <laughs> mm. That's actually a really important point because like when you said like I only take people to an eight. I was like, oh, okay, so what? why That'd wouldn't you just take few. people to 10? Yeah. yeah. But what you're saying is actually like on a scale of 1 of, of 0 to 10, right, you actually help people go from 2 to 11, 12, 13, 14, and just like break their barriers each time. Like you basically, you're like there is no 10. There is just... Let's go all the way up to a hundred on a on a scale of one to ten, right? Yeah, in a, in a sense, um, it's and it's you ascend as high. I think in life you ascend as high as you want to go. So um, I yeah. think that for the most part, like my overarching framework for life is as you um, as you become stronger physically, mentally, like you have better relationships, and then your relationships um, or in stronger physically mentally your money and your relationships get better and all that kind of feeds into each other like as you have more money yeah. you can have better vacations give me better people which may help with more business or better vacation means i get to work on a beach now instead of inside of a gym in my garage like you're <laughs> it's constantly uh there's an, uh, there's always an upward spiral to life i think if you're constantly trying to improve there's always ways to improve so yeah to your point 10 what may have been a 10 now for you is probably not what a 10 was for you five ten years ago and so that right. tends always tends always moving. I think there's always almost always a way to improve the system. And so even though I yeah. have frameworks and systems and stuff like that, like the 
there's always ways to improve skill sets. Yeah. So, as an example, uh, I'll, I'll just give an example. So, for example, one yeah. of them is like appreciation. So, to make your wife um, one of to what your wife needs, essentially, generally speaking, heard and safe in a relationship. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways you can make her feel seen is by telling her appreciation. And so level, like a base level is like, oh, thanks for uh, doing the groceries. And then a next level on top of that is thanks for doing the groceries and picking out the stuff all the kids really like, because that's um, really means a lot that it's really nice that you look out for the family in that way. And so like, you know, this, it's like a little bit deeper. You can improve right. your skill set by being more specific in your praise means more to the person. So being more, it's awesome. yeah, it's Stuff like that for your spouse or stuff like that. You can even do that for a coworker. It's like telling a coworker or someone who works for you, like, great job on that report versus good job on the report. I really liked how you color coded where we're in the red and where we're in the green because that makes it a lot easier. That means a lot more than like good job on the report. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's actually something really interesting and something I never thought of. So, you, you know, you're also teaching me stuff like, um, <laughs> that's awesome. That's really cool. Um, but yeah, thanks for explaining that because I think that's an important nuance, uh, you know, the whole, the scale thing and going from two to 10 or two to eight, right? I think when you shared, when, I think when you shared that, um, that really makes a, a big difference to the whole message that you're giving off because nobody nobody likes to be told i can only get you to eight but you're gonna have to go to 10 by yourself uh, but true, yeah. when you say like i actually help people ex i help people actually like expand their horizons beyond 10 that's way more compelling and actually makes a lot more sense um with what you do it was good yeah. for you to, to call that out because like in my own head like that's just the way the math works <laughs> it's like when you hit to eight, right. the goal moves, and then now you're back at a six, so you have to push to eight, and then you move it back again. Yeah. So, thanks for thanks for calling. Yeah, no. I didn't specify that either. Yeah, no worries. I just for the viewers and for the people listening, like I wanted them to know, like, no, you can actually, you can just keep working for people with people and like help keep improving their relationship. Like, um, always always room to grow. Always what? Oh, there's always room to grow. I think. Yeah, absolutely. So what, um, like, would you, do you want to share some of like what your framework is or do you want to share some of like how, yeah, like how do you, how do, how do you help people achieve that? Yeah. yeah. Cause, um, so generally I think moving forward, I tried to do a group, uh, a group session of it, but I found that in the okay. group session, people don't really go as deep because there's other guys on the call and sometimes we're just run, running out of time. And so one of the more effective ones is uh, we're doing a one-on-one -on call and then the call is generally from an hour, hour and a half. Uh, then from the hour and a half, I listen to where there are issues in the relationship. So like where conflicts had occurred kind of in your situation, I give, um, I give suggestions or tools that would help aid them in the future for example so um one like a lot of it is the tactical empathy but a lot of it i found just as you're saying is that self-restraint is a big factor and the ability to mm -hmm. oh i actually wanted to expound on that when you had mentioned it but then the conversation had slightly shifted one of the things i i'm yeah. having uh my guys do is like if they ever if they get caught in a situation where they're not sure how they're coming across is to imagine like take a second and imagine yourself looking at yourself from behind the person's uh, shoulder you're talking to. So I'm talking to my wife. Imagine me standing behind my wife, looking at me, hearing what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Does that sound angry or look mm -hmm. angry? Or does it sound calm and like you're curious? Not calm or mm -hmm. curious, what would that look like? And then just take mm -hmm. that and use that now. <laughs> that's what you should be, right. that's how you should be saying. Absolutely. Um, there's other minor stuff too where it's, uh, a lot, of it, a lot of it, in a way, is conflict resolution, but I also try and remind the people to... Even Kobe has this relationship um, ratio of, like, one to five. Remember that? Or I, I'm sure you've probably read it. No. Oh. Uh, no, I haven't. Okay. Um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I actually hadn't read the whole book, but then I'd heard about this from a marriage therapist. 
this ratio from a marriage therapist and I told this other guy about it who was asking me questions and he was like, oh, that's from Stephen Covey's uh, Seven Habits. And I was like, oh, I'm probably gotcha. gonna read book at some point. <laughs> <laughs> My brother's read it like five times. He was like, Dude, you gotta read this. And I was like, I, I read the table of contents and I think I, think I got it. <laughs> <laughs> but essentially the, the marriage ratio is um, you want for every one bad interaction, you want at least five good interactions. Mm. If it's below that, then the marriage, what this guy was saying is marriage is generally on the rocks. And then if it's above that, then you're in a pretty good spot. One to seven, I think was the average for good. And then like thriving, super good marriages are like one. To 10. Uh, and mm. ways to improve that ratio. Well, what people would, would ask like what connotates a bad interaction versus a good interaction. Uh, being an accountant by, by trade, um, anything that's neutral, I count as like nothing. And then if it's a bad interaction, if my wife walks away frustrated with any kind of negative emotion, like frustrated or stressed or whatever, mm -hmm. that would be a, a bad interaction. And then good interactions are anytime where there's like praise or I make, her feel, I make her feel happy or laugh or et cetera. So ways to improve that are, uh, what I mentioned earlier, like appreciation, um, and then essentially like labeling her emotions is another big one. So it makes her feel heard. So that way she feels understood mm -hmm. walking away versus like, he just doesn't get me. Cause then, <laughs> and so it's a, uh, one of the initial activities is essentially take an audit of your marriage, like take a week and every day, write down, like take a tally of how many good versus how many bad did I do? Mm -hmm. It's not, if it's not where you want it to be, then you have to find more things to praise your wife about essentially, or talk to your wife in a, in a positive way about, so that way you can boost this. This is free coaching guys. Like I'm learning from this already. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a numbers guy and I was like, there has to be some way to quantify good versus bad. Like, <laughs> it can't just be, that's like, really good. It feels good. Like that's not a good gauge because it can be a crappy situation for your wife, but you feel good. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna write that down. That's awesome. That's really good. Thank you. It's stuff that you if we implement with your guys too as they're going through the healing process. It's like this is the quota you're trying to hit. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. This is definitely going to enrich my uh, my services too. Not that I want to go into marriage coaching. I don't feel like that's something I I can do authority. I can do with authority um, yet. Um, also. There's an element to where like kids get involved and that's something I just know nothing of yet. And yeah, so, yeah. Um, but, oh, good. but the whole, like, like the whole, like preventing the comp, preventing the breakup. That's all that's been fine. Hold on that, man. I learned a lot from you. Like yeah. in your session that does, I got a, some good notes here and I was like, this is, <laughs> i'm glad really good uh i do a little bit with kids too but kids and maintaining your relationships uh, all around has generally the same framework from what i've seen sure so actually the same tool set whether or not you're with kids the only nuance with kids is depending on it's a little bit more age dependent than it is with your spouse because i mean once you're an adult <laughs> you can't really talk to a five-year-old the same way you talk to an adult so I give, um, I also give a few just from a uh, martial arts instructor background, the stuff that I had learned, um, that helped kids listen or to be more connected to help influence them to become a better martial artist. Those are kind of stuff I drop in and sprinkle in as in case they need it. Mm. Some guys need that. That's awesome. <laughs> well, when I'm married, I know where I'm going. <laughs> Thanks, man. And um, yeah, if I if people come to me with the dire situation, I know exactly where to point them. Yeah, same. No, I actually think I might know some people who I can kind of send your way. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Um, so, yeah, uh, but so back on the whole, um, work like. Yeah, no, but you asked me the question, like, what are the top six things? Oh, okay. um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what, what would yours be? Um, that's a good question. I think so this, this the would be the, the top six things that men need to 
move themselves up the relationship scale. I would say the first one is actually um, not having to do so much over the relationship, but I would say the first one is you need to know your values as a man and where you're headed. That's important also is because I think have that, then you're in, you haven't been working on yourself in a broken car. And if you don't have a destination, then your car's not going anywhere. It's only a matter of time before one. That makes sense. Um, so, yeah, values as a man and where you're going. The second thing I would say is, much like you, I would say um, practicing self-restraint and tone of voice is very big. And for that's something I personally had to learn um, because yeah, my uh, do you know Jordan Peterson? Yep. Yeah, Peterson has this uh, big five personality test. And I okay. this test and my score is actually zero. I scored zero both. I think it, I took it twice just to double check and my compassion score is actually zero. Um, wow. I had understood like my, 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 I, I don't know if this is even really matters, but I remember hearing compassion was like the ability for you to stand in someone else's shoes and see the situation from their perspective, I think, or maybe it's not. Maybe I think I think it, that's more empathy, right? Maybe empathy. Yeah, I think in your definition that that means more like empathy. And so, I because I raised my whole life, I was I essentially had to I was fighting my whole life, and so a lot of situations that I think some people would see as stressful, I would just be like, "That's normal." Yeah, that's all. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> and so, um, even though I would learned the communication skills, like this is what to say in the situation, uh, there is. It came off wrong because my tone wasn't there, and your tone mm. is more than your words. Like I think words are like ten percent of communication versus yeah. tonality is like thirty or forty. And so, forty, yeah, yeah. Mastering tonality and um, mastering tonality was essentially something I had to like learn. Something I'm still trying to be conscious of because wow. especially if stuff is like very stressful, sometimes I'll say something and then I'll have to I'll apologize later because it's like but my tone in that wasn't very nice, and I apologize, and I didn't mean to. Have, mm. I, I didn't mean to say it like that. I was just trying to convey that we need to get all the kids in the car soon, not like angrily. So every now and then it, uh, right. yeah, every now and then there's still, still faults. So I'm still not batting a hundred, but it, I have, I know the know how to, to navigate. So that'd be number two is, um, tonality. Number three would be understanding that. I think this is where like people got super pissed at me, but I think understanding that when your wife is talking to you, she's trying to build connection more so than like relaying information to you because as guys, we're just problem solvers. Right. Like, we're here part of the day and it's like, oh, and this went wrong. And then we'd be like, well, get off the freeway next time. It's like, doesn't probably want to hear that when she's telling you about her day. <laughs> she's just trying to connect with you. And learning the, the tool sets around how to connect with your wife better, I think would be great. Yeah. Uh, going, uh, expressing appreciation for the things that are done. Probably the fourth one. That's a big one because that allows her to feel seen. So her efforts in the relationship are seen and appreciated. And I think that helps prevent what you were saying, where people are in that, some people are in that game of removing giving. And who can remove her as yes. fastest as a winner? And so showing appreciation for when they do give, I think, helps, is, helps as a fail safe against that. It's like the antidote. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. It makes me laugh because some people like on on Instagram get so pissed where when you use the word like helping, it's like it's not helping. In what context? It's a, it's a, so it would be like household stuff. It's like uh, I'd say like, oh, that's really cool. I'd say something like, uh, or like, oh, when I'm done working, I help my wife with the kids. And then people are like, you're not helping your wife with the kids because that's your job. And I was like, what? <laughs> Some people have nothing better to do. I know. It's, it's nuts. It does, I, I had like the, I had double checked and I was like, I think if, if someone were to, who was working for me still owed me a report and sent me the report, I wouldn't be like, I'm not thanking you because that's your job. Like, that's just ridiculous. I'd thank you for the report. Like, 
thanks for, <laughs> thanks for yeah <laughs> yeah 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 people are lighter than nuts <laughs> <laughs> no they really are That's i mean crazy. some people yeah it's and it's like it's like they really just assume the worst so that they can like pick at it yeah yeah because there's so much there's so much like as what we, what you just said like words are only seven percent of what's being said seven to ten percent and then the tone of voice is close to 40 and then body language right? is the other 60 right yeah yeah so it's like you're just in you're like you're people don't realize that they read with the text with their own inner voice yeah yeah and it's literally like their own voice that they are reading it with rather than actually reading it with your tone of voice mm. so it's like really more of a reflection of themselves rather than it's stuff i have to like remind myself and i'm still learning too yeah it's, it's crazy space <laughs> yeah um shoot so that was uh Go back to the list. Number five. That number no, that was four. Express okay. appreciation was four. Okay. I would say number five is having. I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. Having Take time. good, because it's there's it's important to um, have regular like date nights because it's very tempting to. <laughs> get caught in the the uh, nine to five stuff and like i know if i was by myself like i don't need to go out and have dates i'll just keep working i'm more than happy to keep working but i'm like 99.99 percent sure my wife wants to go on dates every now and then <laughs> <laughs> so having regular date nights and then um i guess the key point for date night is just try and do something you've never done or go somewhere you've never gone because it, it, going to new places together builds builds bonds Mm. Your experience builds bonds. And so if you're, I mean, every now and then it's nice to like go to the same restaurant, order the same thing, but only go to that restaurant and order the same thing after like the fourth time you're going there. Like, dude, can we do something else? So a way to do that is like, when was the last time you had learned something new with your wife? When is the last time you went somewhere new with your wife? Mm. That, that helps the new experience helps build, build, uh, build bonds. Gotcha. And and then for I think for for in a workplace environment that's just like a good uh, like the team building days I think maybe I don't know if that's I don't know how people feel about that mm -hmm. I can pers this is stuff where it's like personally I don't care for it, but I can see why mm -hmm. there's merit to it for other people because mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. um, I'm more than happy to just so you guys can do work but other people really like the outside bonding stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. right. Some people just don't want to work either. There's also that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, just on that, before we before we get to number six, if you have one, uh, so do you when you're with your clients, do you work with them to like create like ideas for dates and things that could be good for their relationship? Yeah, um, one of the things we check in every week is essentially when's the next time you're going to go on a date with your wife. That's like on the goal to do list is scheduling a date. Um, just to make sure it's always, that's awesome. Uh, it's always happening because it's, it, I don't know. I think it's really easy to fall off. And especially if, um, yeah, it's just really easy to fall off. It's just like, Oh, I've been working so hard and then things get busy. And then if it's not put on your calendar before other things, suddenly you're, weekend calendar is full of other social stuff you have to do instead of connecting, right. connecting with your spouse. So do you, cause this is, this is something that I'd, that I'd heard from another friend. He's an entrepreneur. He's, um, he's, he's a lot more established than where I'm at. Um, and he said he has a cadence of, he's got a weekly, he's got like a weekly check-in night where he like, does a check-in with his wife. Yeah. Then he's got a weekly date night, which is separate from the check-in. And then he's got a weekly sex night. <laughs> it's like, it's like the only, the only thing that like the only goal of that night is to achieve, to, to like have intimacy. And I don't know if like it's a sex a hundred percent of the time. And it's like intimacy in other ways, other times, but, um, yeah, how do you like what what's your take on that? Like how do you 
Um, recently, we've started to implement the weekly uh, check-in nights because I've heard those were a good idea. Uh, just to, it, it's a way for your wife to feel heard also because then she can, it's mm. having that um, separate than the date is a good idea. And it's something I've recently implemented. So it's not something like I teach or have super into the curriculum yet. But the weekly check-in night uh, is, mm -hmm. there's strategies for how to make that fun. So it's not like a, a team meeting because no one really likes to go to a team meeting in corporate services. Mm. <laughs> yeah, how to make it fun. Yeah, there's, there's tips for how to do that where essentially you, you go over the logistics, but then you also go over the things that you really appreciated them doing. In case you forgot to mention to your spouse that you really appreciated them picking up your coffee, that's a good time to bring up, hey, thanks for bringing uh, thanks for getting the coffee that I really mm. That's another bump into that right marriage mm. too. Um, so that's generally, uh, generally I think it's a good thing. A lot of families practice that and then it's a good way to set up goals. And I think it doesn't affect me as much yet because we don't have kids who are older with other errands to do yet. But as you get older, I can imagine if there's only two drivers and then now there's four destinations because you have a destination, your spouse, and then your two kids each have destinations. Coordinating the logistics is probably mm. on the front end. Um, yeah. Intimacy wise, that's something I don't really touch on. Um, and I leave that per couple just because okay. maybe partially it's uh, just a Catholic background and I'm like hesitant to touch mm. that subject. I think it's overall ideas on that are it's, it's important to the marriage, should happen fairly often. And I heard this from someone else, but it was essentially like kind of weird for me to say on air for the first time because it's something I believe in my head, but <laughs> I've never actually said it out loud. Yeah. And it's like, if, you're, hear it. if your spouse isn't asking you for the next time it's going to happen, you need to find a way to perform better in bed. Okay. <laughs> I'd heard that from another, from another coach and I was like, okay, I'm going to keep that in mind. I don't know how I'm going to say that yet, but that's. <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> well, that you just said it. I just said it. So that's something I also keep in mind um, as well. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes absolute sense. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, the whole intimacy thing is, is a really interesting one. And I actually, I think that, you know, I think there's a lot of guys who uh, want to improve mm -hmm yeah their their sexual intimacy with their wives so that it doesn't seem like that should be an area where you shy away from yeah i'm i think it personally um, it's uh because i have i have frameworks in my head that i don't say out loud specifically because it's on somebody to be not comfortable yet i'm not confident well mm -hmm. i'm uncomfortable i don't know if i'm not confident i'm uncomfortable <laughs> presenting that side yet just because in it's mm. it's like a little taboo i guess and especially with the philippine background that's a. Mm. That's also very taboo to speak about. So mm. it's something I have to. I'm trying to overcome that stuff to to better help them. Um, yeah, you're, yeah, you're kind of basically breaking start breaking your own mental barriers there. Yeah, yeah. There's if it gets to that like if people need help in that area, I have frameworks or leak like, or um, gauges to where it's like if you don't if it's not like the, like one of them I just told you if she's not asking you for it then probably look at the resources or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess to elaborate since we're on air about it, there's a, he essentially said like they, the experience for a woman is like 10 times greater than that of a guy's. And so if it's amazing mm. for you, it's supposed to be like 10 times more amazing for them and you crave it. So you have to make it in a way where it's like where they also would want it. Um, and mm ways to do that via well, number one is I think the number one complaint is like emotional intimacy throughout the day stuff like making them feel heard or like mm -hmm. doing stuff where you hug them at random points of the day so it's not like zero to a hundred right when you you guys both lay down no <laughs> that's that's kind of been right going on uh, been going on throughout the day um, but yeah I haven't really focused too much on that yet just because like you said I'm getting through the mental barriers of it yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and they're hard, especially when you come from, you know, it sounds like Catholicism has really given you 
uh, not only spiritual strength, but a framework from which to view your life. And it doesn't sound like you kind of want to, uh, and it, there's a sanctity to that framework, right? So it doesn't, you don't want to defile it in any way. It sounds like, um, I think it might just be like, cause it, I would say overall in general, the church doesn't talk about the intimacy part that much. Mm. It's not very like mm-hmm. operated on. And I think for, I don't know why I, I tend not to question why that often. I just look at how is it applicable in my life, and that's the end of, <laughs> that's the end of where right. I look. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that I I know that the the weight of the Catholic upbringing plus the Philippine well, because Philippines is like ninety percent Catholic, so it's yeah, very Catholic, Catholic country. Yeah. Um, that one also is. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to get over those to help that part of it. Yeah. Oh, so it sounds like there might be family watching your stuff who might. Yeah, and I know that part of my audience is also like um, guys who used to watch me from Taekwondo. Oh, really? Yeah, and they, I've, since I haven't moved the audience over yet. Like I didn't start a whole new channel. My the guys were just like, dude, just start putting fatherhood content on there. Right, right, right. Uh, that's part of why I, I don't go into it that much, but. I think I'll want to mm. approaching if I've ever asked about it. Like I have, I have decent frameworks or at least gauges. So that makes sense. That, no, that doesn't make sense. You want to, you maybe once you're, <laughs> what, sorry. I'll keep it like PG or like kid friendly <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that makes sense. Um, and so, okay, so regular date nights and check-in nights. And then the last, do you have a sixth thing? I almost think if, if you have those five, you're in a pretty good spot. Because if you, you know mm. where you are and where you're going, and you're constantly improving that self-restraint, mm. or wherever you're trying to avoid when you're speaking. Those are the principles, yeah, I think it sounds those are like. The, those, are the main, those are the main ones. Mm. Um, <laughs> I guess no, nah, because that goes under the, yeah, that goes under number one. So I think we're good. <laughs> kind of, I think that that's pretty much the the top, the top ones would be would be those. Yeah, that's cool, man. Um, yeah. So I guess one question, like, can we pause for a sec? Like, yeah, yeah. how are you? How are you feeling? How are you? I'm good. You're uh, good. Yeah. You good? I'm still like unsure even a whole about the whole even now just mentally i'm just like i'm not sure if i should put that into me stuff in there <laughs> the intimacy stuff, intimacy stuff but i think eventually it's important for marriage and i think that's actually a big selling point i've noticed with a lot of coaches like do you want to have more oh, sex yeah. with your wife join my program yeah <laughs> i was about to say that as well like sex sells you know yeah. um unfor- i mean unfortunately and, 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 and like and unfortunately i think well, and, well, yeah. <laughs> well, not that kind of selling. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. Um, but, um, yeah, no, I th- intimacy is a really, really big piece. Uh, and actually, that's you know one of the things that one of my friends who was who was telling me that he uh, that he's kind of stuck around basically like a three or four. Um, he what that sex is one of his one of his things with his wife that he wants to improve so you know it's not oh i don't it's not i don't well, sorry let me just oh yeah yeah go ahead go ahead i was gonna say it's not not um like that's it's not skeevy or it's not uh i guess wrong to talk about it if you're actually helping someone with a problem yeah, yeah, I can see that making okay, makes sense. I have to reframe it in my head like that. It helps a lot. Yeah, yeah, I've had to do some of that with you know some of the marketing stuff that I do and whatnot. Okay. Um, one thing I was gonna say was like uh, was for intimacy, make sh- like try and ensure you're coming at it from a place of giving instead of a place of receiving. Okay. Mm, yeah some guys are like needy it's like no i need to like get off we're supposed to feel connected and you're just using me to jerk off essentially <laughs> right um, right this is if you're giving and you're like want to be connected then it's, it, it's coming from a different place and i think your spouse feels that 
Absolutely. Yeah, they definitely do. How do you... So let me ask you this for your viewers. How do you... How do you reconnect? Because like what you're basically alluding to is the fact there that the physical intimacy has to have the basis of an emotional intimacy of some kind. It has to be like a true connection rather than uh, just a mere erotic release mm. or like a urge, urgeful release. So how, if someone, if someone's in a relationship, like how do they reconnect if they've lo- maybe lost it, maybe lost that connection? Um, number one is to, uh, so point number one is like have your values as a man and be on your way to your destination. Um, I think, mm-hmm. I think, a lot of people lose the sexual intimacy part because if you're not the man in your relationship, you default to being the son of your wife. Mm, damn. I, I, heard that from, I heard that from someone else. So that's not an original. I wish that was an original, but I was like, that's a good quote. <laughs> <laughs> it's still great. I mean, it's still a mind blowing quote. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what, that's what went wrong in my first relationship. And then I was trying to implement that same framework, which essentially I think is what Will Smith got to, he ended up slapping Chris Rock while they're separated. So it's definitely not a good model. <laughs> I, I, I say that because I, I really followed Will and was on board with like his, his vengeance story of like, I'm successful because this girl cheated on me when I was 16. And I was like, yeah, be successful. And then I was like, oh, he's reading all these books. That makes sense. Because if I sucked up marketing, I'd read all these books. And then he'd, he did all that. And then his that ended up going downhill um and i was like Mm. okay so that's definitely not the answer and then in my own relationship i had also seen that and what essentially happened was in my marriage i had become the son and i was asking her for a direction like what do you want me to do and Mm. it's not like you take away all the dictating power from her wife like she still weighs in on me and stuff but the final sure final it's like you're uh she's cfo to a ceo like he's she's telling you where things are at and then you're still the ceo with a vision like this is where we're going um, and so when yeah. you say, what do you want me to do? Like in what context? Almost like, uh, if you go down, like a very simple one is like when you go downstairs and like the house is a mess and the kids are screaming, like that was, that's speaking of your timing part. That's not a good time to say, what do you want me to do? It's like, well, you can help console one of the screaming kids. <laughs> you can pick up stuff. You can help with dinner. Like there's so many things you could do <laughs> without having to ask your wife, what do you want me to do in the situation? That's a, that's a really basic one. Um, mm, okay. Oh, I was going to say point number six. This one just dawned on me because this is something I'm still trying to build also. Mm. Is having a brotherhood of other men around you is important. Because mm. that one, I'm uh, sorry to like sidetrack this again. Uh, no, that's fine. It's really important and something I totally agree with. Uh, well, for, for me, it's important because even though your wife and well social media says just 100 percent vulnerable with your wife blah 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 but then it's like if mm. you're i it's important to have that emotional vulnerability every now and then to, to let her know where you're at but you can't if you are too emotional then what happens is she feels like she has to solve your emotional situation does that make sense and so that's another thing for her to do versus like mm. i'm a man and like this is currently how i'm feeling but this is my plan of attack for how to fix it like that's very different than like right oh, right, I'm right. sad and like four days in a row you're just sad and you're in bed well it's like now you're sad and in bed and now we don't have food because you haven't been working like that's <laughs> it's a, but if you are feeling sad and you are depressed the person you the people you bring that to are, is your brother us who wants you to be better who can also call the situation as you see it like essentially it'd be like your best your friends who can see the situation outside the frame for you that's awesome. I think that's uh, that'd be point number six is to have the brotherhood of people you can rely on and ask for help when you are in the in the picture. For Stan Mock says you can't read the label if you're in the jar. Like that's. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, can't read the label if you're in the jar. I like that. Yeah, Mock one. Uh, and to go back to the other point, I guess for the intimacy. Yeah. Um, yeah, you default to being a boy, and so you, I think even before the relationship part is number one is make sure that you're actually being um, a man who does self-respecting things. Like make sure you're working out, make sure you're building yourself at that kind mm-hmm. of um, framework first. 
And if you have that, then you can start building, then it's easier to build the emotional. Because gotcha. if you're doing that and you're essentially self validated because you're a guy and you're earning your own respect, like I'm doing these things. Then when you're building emotional connection, it's not like I need your validation from this. It's just like, I'm letting you, I'm connecting with you. I'm letting you know how you feel versus like, I need you to make me feel okay. Hmm. Right. Hopefully, hopefully that's making sense. But what, what's your take on it? Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, I don't coach people through that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, right. I, mean, I just like, what, what, at, at yeah, this okay. point, at this point, at this point, um, at the point where they're like close to breakup, there is definitely no sexual intimacy or emotional okay. intimacy. Like it's, yeah. it's bad. Mm. Um, or even if they do, if they do have sex, it's very unfulfilling and like they kind of walk away. Yeah. Yeah. They kind of don't feel connected. They don't feel like it was, you know, um, fulfilling beyond just the kind of physical nature of it. Yeah. Like, uh, um, I had a good adjective for as you're saying it, but then I forgot. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to try this pause feature for a second, but yeah, having a brotherhood that makes total sense. Um, and so how would you, So one of the things that I think a lot of guys feel right now is they actually, no, I think a lot of guys don't have a brotherhood. I, that's part of why I started what I'm doing right now. Cause I felt throughout fatherhood, I felt very, even though my dad is cool, I'm a cool with my dad, but it's like, I, I felt alone is part mm. of why I'm doing what I do. Yeah. Um, that makes total sense. And how, so like you basically are offering a brotherhood, right? Like that's what you're doing. You have a group of guys and you help them through their stuff. And you guys, it sounds like there's some kind of collaborative nature to this. Like you guys will throw ideas around to each other, like what works, what doesn't work. Um, yeah, I'm trying to build it. I want more people like in the community or get, get more people in the community, which I'm uh, figuring out how to build. Cause I think community building is its own skill set. So I'm oh yeah, very much. I'm learning how to do that. Um, there's a couple guys in there right now, and things are going well. We're able to uh, we're able to get good ideas off of each other. Like two of two of the guys just had their kids. Like one of them had their kid last week, and the other one had their kid like a oh, week wow. ago. And so uh, nice. me and like the other dad who's in there um, were able to spitball ideas for like make sure your go bag is ready. A week, week thirty six. Even though they say it's going to give birth on week forty, week thirty six could come any day. So have your bag ready at week thirty six. Mm. Different ways of just like weird nuance stuff. Like how best ways to put a baby to sleep. How do you coordinate who's staying up at night for the kid? Like that. All all these tips and tricks and whatnot. That's awesome. Yeah, that's that's really great. Um, sounds like you're probably helping a lot of guys like that too. Oh, a couple, and then and I'm I want to help more, which is why I'm learning marketing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Aren't we all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but oh, uh, what, like, what about you though? Do you uh, do you have a brotherhood as, like that you're building, or that you have a community, or? I yeah, actually, it's funny you say that. It's not something that I that I have. Um, I, you know, ever since, and I, it's something I, I've realized over the last few years is something that's really missing from my life. <laughs> Um, we, I was the kid in high school who was like, had a lot of different friend groups, but like, wasn't like stuck to one friend group. And so I was, I was like, I was like almost the opposite of you. I was like a social butterfly in, in high school. Like, um, I was also like the, the student body president, like everybody okay. knew me. Yeah. So like I was at the, in high school, like I, you know, I was prom king uh no i wasn't prom king okay. I was but <laughs> uh but you know i was i was very active and, and kind of pretty known in school uh and then after that i i went to university and i just became a number right wow. um because i went to like a really big university and then 
which was like very different because I went to a very a pretty small high school comparatively. Um, there were only like a hundred people in my in my grade, so oh, okay. uh, yeah, everybody knew each other, and the relationships were kind of deeper. And even if you didn't know, because like obviously not everybody knew each other, but everybody at least knew of each other. Yeah, yeah. And so you know, and then I got really ill. And, you know, while I was at university, so I never really managed to make like really solid friendships at university that, you know, with other guys, um, just because like while everybody was out partying, I, I couldn't go. Right. So, um, and it was just like be even being social, like I, I couldn't do it at that time. Now, now I'm fine. But like at the time I wasn't able to. So I kind of, I'm now in my late twenties and I don't have this kind of group of guys or friend group that I can kind of fall back on and be like, Hey, like, what's up? I I have a friend from, you know, elementary school that I still talk with, but I don't have like a group or community setting. And that's something I'm definitely looking for. Um, so yeah. Okay. Fair enough. That's, that's where I found myself also. And I was like, this is, uh, Seems like it's an issue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. At what point did you find that? So it sounds like you kind of relate to that story a little bit. Yeah. Um, I didn't have a friend group. And part of what actually prompted me to go find a community and where I learned about this brotherhood um, thing was, I remember the saying, that's like, you're the average of the five people you hang out with the most. Yeah. yeah. And I was yeah. like, if I want to become super wealthy, that's I have to go find people who <laughs> yeah um, and so yeah that's what that's essentially what started the quest and then I um, there's uh they're like do you watch uh, like fresh and fit or whatever no oh. what's that fresh and fits like a red pill um, it's like it, I would say it's more of an entertainment show it's in the red pill manosphere kind of thing okay and uh, they essentially just bring people on. They, they bring on girls who are not always the best representation of women. And then they have arguments with them about what's right or what's not right in society. But one of the, like, <laughs> on the back end of the entertainment show, these guys are like, um, have decent financial tips. Um, they'll sometimes bring someone on who's like a real estate mogul or whatever and like pick his brain on the show about like how, what's the best way to invest in real estate. Like one of those guys, I haven't joined it, but there's, uh, for example, one of the guys has a paid community that you can join. Like, so there's, uh, mm. there's stuff like that where like that I joined like two or three of those kind of stuff just to meet other people. And from there, I found some guys who were like cool to talk to. And then there's other guys like, mm. like in life, like however, it's just like, oh, there's sure. guys probably I'll never talk to this dude again. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. yeah but there are um what's it called but there's groups like that so um where it's, it's like a it's like a paid networking event essentially you can join to, sure. to meet other people who are like that and every now and then you meet a guy who's just a social climber weirdo and like, you're just obviously not friends with that dude but then every now and then you meet another guy who's pretty chill yeah i have a couple of those guys and then i'm what i'm learning now and what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to build um kind of community aspect for guys because i understand that especially in our culture now it's people are left out like a lot i think especially yeah. guys are left out there's not that many resources for yeah especially guys and dudes who are maybe more conservative or more traditional in a certain sense yeah uh the mainstream doesn't really uh <laughs> yeah 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 it doesn't it doesn't i heard um what was interesting was um, just really, really quick. There's a couple I know. Yeah. One of them's from like the Midwest, and she's like, "Church here is weird. Like, you guys go to church, and then everyone just goes home. Like, for my life, that's all we did. We went to church and we went home right after. We didn't stay and talk." But she's like, "Apparently, in the Midwest, there's actual like community. Like, people stay around after like church and they talk, and like the guys talk. And there's times where all the guys will go to church for a night, and all the wives have, you know, stay home with the kids, and then there's vice versa. So another day, all the wives go. So like." I think churches maybe mm. in the Midwest are a little bit better at building this community aspect versus like over here owns like mm. I got dinner. See ya. <laughs> like, I'm yeah. Like, that makes a lot of sense too. Even in the Catholic church, even in the Catholic church. Yeah. Um, wow. I haven't felt a 
big sense of community. I've I've met guys out who are in the Catholic Church, but not necessarily like from that physical church community where I like built mm -hmm. awesome friendships with them. But not necessarily like I met this dude at church and now we're like the best of friends. Like that's I don't think that's right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. It's funny because I I actually was raised Catholic, yeah. um, but I never really. I never really connected. Um, I struggled connecting to the church for various reasons that uh, I don't really necessarily want to go into right now. Yeah. But, uh, um, but yeah, I don't know where I was going with this. But oh yeah, it's funny because even when we we did go to some churches going growing up, like community wasn't necessarily there um, as well, and I didn't know if that was a catholic church thing or if that was just a, a jew like other churches were the same so hey like from my understanding it's from here on the west coast that we apparently we don't do <laughs> where are you based so i'm from sacramento uh, california i grew up in oh. uh, the bay area and then I'm, okay you're on, you're on the east coast right yeah i'm in uh i'm in new york state i'm just outside of new york city okay so yeah. i guess it's the same over there maybe it's only the midwest who's got it right <laughs> yeah maybe i mean i don't i i don't go to church here um the only place i go to church is uh in italy and my grandmother comes from a small town in uh, in the mountains oh okay and uh and yeah that's the place i'll, I'll always go to church precisely because of that community element i get to see all the townspeople and um they they get to see me and I mean I pray and stuff I'm spiritual outside of uh, that but I I just don't I don't uh, I don't feel connected to actually going to mass on Sundays it's more for the community element. Um, there was a time where I was uh, I did, I kind of fell away from the Catholic Church and I became Christian for a little bit. And okay. Christian churches I think is like. 99% community. It's, it's pretty interesting um, going to their masses. It must be nice. Is it nice? Um, yeah. Yeah. You, you go over there and then like you're welcomed right away and they can tell if you're new because they can see like they have uh, people who are assigned to correct you uh, and then have you sit next to people and like introduce and afterwards there's all these other like different activities. Mm. They do a really good job facilitating community, I'd say. Hmm. But yeah, that was that was interesting. Um, that was an interesting year. So, and you obviously can decline to answer this, but what made you try a Catholic, try a Christian church, and then what made you wanted to go back to the Catholic Church? Oh, uh, yeah, I can I can answer this. Um, even though it's kind of like off topic, so I don't know. If we can probably make, cut this section out if you. It's not yeah, I can pause it. I can oh, pause it if you want. We can have it in case. Just in case, I don't know. Or you can just cut and yeah. <laughs> it's easy to control X and delete on the editor, so easy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what had happened was uh 2016 well, leading up to around 2016, I was like falling more and more away from the church. I wasn't too um too big on it. And I was like, everyone goes, I don't see the point of going like mm -hmm. the use of my time going to the Catholic Church, in my opinion, saying like you know, like I guess I don't mean like disrespect, but in a way like wrote prayers like this is just stuff they've been saying for thousands of years like the our father and all that like yeah i don't yeah. see the value add to my life um right and then the the five ten minute homily that the priest gives is like sometimes they're not a good order and so i get zero value from that. right right um there's the idea of the sacraments which i'm still trying to like wrap my head around in the catholic church uh, mm -hmm. besides that i was like i don't see the value add like i guess long story short i don't see the value add to my life to go into mass on sundays and then okay. um, I had tried to, especially because there's no community element, like you're saying, there's, right. there's no, no value. Apparently there's no value add. So after that, I went to, uh, I tried for the Rio 2016 Olympic spot, but I lost to the London 2012 Olympian um, in sudden death. And that was like the culmination of everything I've been trying to work for like my whole life. Mm. Um, so after that, I entered like a six month depression, essentially. And like I wasn't mm. sure what I was doing. Um, mm. My brother came through with this book called Purpose Driven Life. You may have heard of it. 
um, I've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's written by, uh, like pastor Rick Warren. And then he was like, I know you're feeling pretty bad. Uh, but Michael Phelps, the swimmer, um, was in a depression and then he read this book and he stopped being in depression. So and in my head, I was like, well, if it's good enough for Phelps, good enough for me. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I ended up reading the book, uh, and it was about like, this essentially what your design is, what, yeah, your design for here being on earth and et cetera, et cetera. And then, uh, and then I was like, okay, well, I think part of the, what I'm missing right now is community. So I need to go find a church that's like this. And so I spent like a month or two trying to find one of the churches. I eventually found one of the churches, the exact same church that like Pastor Rick Warren does, but it's like a satellite site in, out in the Philippines. Okay. Um, and then I ended up going there for a year. Uh, I met my, after, or actually was it a year? I think. I maybe it wasn't a full year, but it was like close to a year. Sure. Um, I met good people over there and then my wife and decided that we wanted to, I, like for me, the wedding was essentially whatever my wife wanted because I didn't care. And I'm sure as a little girl, like my, maybe this isn't all women, but I'm, a majority of women probably have their wedding day planned in their head. Of what it's going to look like. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, that's safe, safe to say. And so in my opinion, yeah. I was like, I just want to show up and whatever you want. To happen, <laughs> as long as you show up, I'm good with whatever. You're like, I don't care if it's 500 guests. Or it's 50. It doesn't matter to me. Um, and then I had done that and we'd done kind of like deeper marriage prep. So before you get married in the Catholic church, um, there's like a state to be like a six month training with a priest and huh. um and it's it's kind of like a uh like once a month check-in like make sure you answer these questions and some of them are pretty good questions like what what would you say the good traits and the bad traits of your uh, of your own parents raising you were and what kind of stuff would you like to pass on to your kids like kind of stuff like that where it's like oh it's kind of reflective and it's good there's also a lot of questions like do you want pets in the house or no pets in the house? Like that's probably stuff you should agree on before you get, <laughs> get married. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of the requirements of this Catholic church marriage is go to a three day, like essentially like marriage boot camp where they teach you about the sacrament of marriage and all the other mm -hmm. stuff that beliefs and you go on. And there was a couple there who was uh, older. I don't want to guess their age because I don't want to. And the dynamic was one that I've never seen before. Like the guy was very strong, um, very, he's very strong, very sure of himself and he's giving good marriage advice. And I remember I was sitting there and his wife, like his wife was just like nodding along and she, she said her section. He's in the middle of his speech and she reaches up at one point and just like barely touches him on the elbow. And he immediately stopped and I was like, um, like, what is it, sweetie? And then she part and I was like, and it, it's, it's, it's like, it's weird because I don't know the exact physical char characteristics that dictate these two people being really in love still. Mm -hmm. um, but I saw that and I was like, whatever that is at that age is I still want that between me and my wife at this age. Like, you know, mm -hmm. like that's, that's the aspirations to be like, be like them. I'm at their age. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of times, uh, a lot of people have presented. Um, one of their spouses had passed away and they had remarried. So this is like their second marriage, essentially, because, you know, way, so <laughs> mm. death do us part. Um, but these guys were still together. And so we asked them, I was like, do you guys do like deeper marriage prep or like deep, do you guys teach classes or teach how to um, teach how to do what you guys have, essentially? Mm -hmm. Like, actually, we do. A lot of people have asked us this question. Um, so we took an additional more like outside of uh, i guess the direct thing you have to do as a requirement i sure. ended up doing six more months with them and essentially it was once a week and they have uh readings picked out by different popes or different people of the church who had written um who had written essays essentially about marriage or and then there's some bible passages and it was essentially like you read this you summarize it you think about what it means to you and then we're going to hop on a call we'll answer questions and explain the meanings of what these mean like what these what they're trying to say here if you have questions or the deeper meaning or the lesson you're supposed to do. So that way you can have a strong marriage mm -hmm. and uh we ended up doing that with them and after reading i guess more advanced readings that you don't have to read 
it's not like required because on Sunday you just hear the, the two the two readings plus the gospel and then there's a homily and then the rest of it's uh, like right, the sacrament right. of the Eucharist. Um, but it was the first time that I read readings outside of outside of what's required in the church, like the essays by the popes, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of it had just made logical sense to me. And so for me, that was like, okay, well, I'm more on board with what, now that I understand more of uh, this perspective of marriage, I'm more on board with like the Roman Catholic way of viewing it. And so. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's what got me. That makes sense. So, but, but, so at this point when you started this marriage course, because I didn't understand how you went from that Christian church to doing the Catholic marriage oh, prep thing. Yeah. Um, I met my wife. And so we were like, not sure which way. Cause I was like, oh, you know, Christianity is cool. Cause I mean, the, when the guy talks Christianity, it's like one hour of how I can apply gospel or old Testament, or new Testament into my life. So it's like one hour right. of value add plus there's the community. So this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of things and I try and think of things in time. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. No, it makes sense. Uh, but she wasn't sure about that or she, I don't know if she was really open. I, I actually don't remember if she was like open to switching, but she knows she wanted it. Oh, she was, she was Catholic and she wanted it. I think, I think that might've been what it was. And then I was like, all right, well, uh, I'm, I know my mom would want me to get Catholic married and to me, whichever church married. If I get married and it's civil, like I'm just happy to do sure, be married. Yeah. Um, which now in the Western world, apparently with all the stats is like apparently not a good idea. <laughs> uh, that's yeah. That's, that's essentially why I switched was to, to help my wife's view of the wedding become true. And then I was like, Oh, well this stuff is actually pretty interesting. So cool. That was a really long winded, but appreciate you listening. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, no, of course. No, it's really interesting. Um, and actually it's something that I've noticed in the clients that I have. And as actually a, a part of the vetting process is they don't need to be Catholic. They don't even need to be Christian, but they do need to have a strong spiritual component, component or connection of some kind, because I find that people who have that, that component they are uh they have they've and who are like are active on that have a have a strong value system and that is part and parcel to the to the integrity of wanting to keep the marriage together yeah um that i i find that true also and i think the reason it's I think almost the reason it's important to have the religion or spiritual factor in your point is because it forces the person to answer to a quote higher than what they feel. Yeah, that's the, exactly. that's the big one. And that's also, um, it helps a lot with helping your wife feel safe is if you have that spiritual or spiritual component or the, uh, the, the, the code of values that's higher than yourself helps definitely with your spouse. Like at least I know what the exact aim is because this is the aim of, matter how he's feeling he's going to stay beholden to the value right next right. of safety but that's, that's that's interesting oh go ahead i was gonna say i was gonna say the same thing that's interesting that you've seen it in that way that it's an action and an added uh i guess uh, dimension or variable to the whole safety safety factor I um I learned that during the the marriage prep because I was like I asked this, the guy the same thing I have to look up my notes but I remember one of them was um, if you're church going then it helps reassure your wife that you answer to a code someone higher than yourself and so you're you're pulled into the code versus like how I'm feeling so if I'm feeling right now like I want to go smash that person down at the bar then it's like well that's not part of the higher moral code so you shouldn't do that versus right no I'm gonna make myself happy so I'm gonna go down there and talk to that chick. Hmm. Gotcha. So that one's a that, makes- that one's not a Chris original, but that was a good little tip. <laughs> <laughs> what were you? Um, you were gonna, you were also going to say something was interesting that I shared. I was saying that's interesting. That's part of your vetting process because um, your ability or your filter for selecting clients is very very precise, and I think that's very good because you're able to help a very specific person with a very specific need. And it's, right. um, it's something I don't have in my, 
my system yet, I guess, is vetting good clients versus bad clients. Um, as far as I can tell, I think part of my vetting system, it seems like the people who value the system a little bit more are those with kids on the way or those with kids. Yeah, um, absolutely. And so that's uh, that may be part of the vetting process in the future, but it's... It's something I've noticed so far, but it's, uh, for me, it was interesting because you have that as part of like part of the vetting process. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, and so if this gets published, any religion is welcome. It's not. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't discriminate. <laughs> I don't discriminate on the religion. I don't discriminate on the um, on belief system or anything. But I've just noticed that like people who have a strong spiritual connection uh, of some kind are very principle driven and also have the have the better results at the end of the day. That's what it's all about. And it's about how well I can secure how, how confidently I can deliver. You know, I've, yeah. Yeah. And part of that is, uh, you know, in, in this kind of coaching scenario, a lot of it is dependent on the other person, um, yeah. you know, cause you're, you're not, you're not the one actually doing the work. It's not a done for you service is a done with you service. So, and so the other person has to uphold their end of the, the bargain there. And, um, but people who have strong principles tend to be really, really good in that, in that regard. Uh, what was, what was I going to say? I can't remember what I was going to say. You mentioned something about the vetting process. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll come back to me. Okay. If, if it comes back, just feel free to share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess, well, like, people just... Maybe I'll ask, I'll ask you this at a different time, because I think it's more of a question on the business versus in the business question. So that's a, yeah. yeah, I'll ask you that at another time. <laughs> more of like a marketing thing. Because I was like, this is... Yeah. For me, it's like very curious. It's, it's really... Um, I'd say it's really interesting and inspirational for me to see that like you've got this this much um, figured out already on your on who you're helping. <laughs> well, I'm glad because I feel like you know, kind of when you're starting out, you don't have that kind of level of confidence that you feel like you can even inspire someone. So I'm glad that what I've shared has been of value to you of as great well. Value. Of, I think it's a, a fantastic value, and I think, um, yeah, Alex, you got a lot of really good know-how on how to solve problems. And I, like a lot of, uh, it's exactly as you said, a lot of people you leave university without these skills, and like this is stuff that even I have to, I have to help people or coworkers or just even just random conflicts where it's just like, how, how do you have this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so this the stuff you're you went into and that the, your ability to go as specific as you do with the nuances and like, why it is fantastic because thanks man i appreciate that for guys like me who are learning and very analytical sided um it's like we need all those little bits and pieces and nuance explicitly yeah said because besides that we wouldn't add it it's like you didn't tell me to do that <laughs> right it's like right you heard how like how do I, what am i doing physically with my face <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly um uh is there any is there other stuff you wanted to go into um no i can't remember what i wanted to share just now um so, but yeah, like, I think what you do is, is really awesome. I, um, is there anything else you want to talk about? Cause I, I feel like we can talk about like working on your business rather than working in your business. Um, and that might not be part of the, yeah, the, the podcast, <laughs> yeah, it's a little, little different subject. Um, Did cover a lot of ground already too, which is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Does does part of your work? Because part of my work involves helping the guy become a better man. Does part of your do right. you find part of your work uh, do that as well, or do you you work with both people at the same time, or is in more of the, like yes, yeah? How how is that dynamic between? Because I help specifically guys. 
um, because yeah. I, I only know that side of the equation. That's the only side I've studied. Just because. Um, but do you help both the guy and the the woman in your situation, or do you mostly just help the dude? Or what's the? Yeah. So I've I've worked with both men and women um, for conflict stuff. Okay. Uh, for like you know, saving relationships on the brink of breakup. Uh, I, I am going to narrow down into working only with guys. Okay. Because I find that it's, um, I just find it more rewarding. Um, personally, I, I do have a free community where anyone can join and I have, uh, men and women in there who are learning these techniques, who are solving their, their relationship stuff. But, um, so I, I, here's like my take on it is I don't, I believe so strongly in these frameworks and these techniques that I also don't think they should be gate kept. So that's why I'm putting them up for free for people at my own cost. Right. Because, um, I'm not, not monetizing that, that, that space. Um, but, I am going to, I'm, uh, I'm specializing now in like guys who come, uh, who are trying to prevent a divorce and I only need to work with one of the, one of the couple, uh, the techniques are powerful to the point where that's all you only need to work with one person to improve the marriage. Like what you're saying, um, it, what I've noticed is that it does take both people they both need to take responsibility for themselves and decide that they themselves want to level up. Uh, but it's not, uh, but I don't, I don't do that as, as part of my service. And I'd add that absolutely. Like I do help men improve themselves, uh, because they are learning these skills. Um, but it's, it's less, it's less of a general, like broad improvement in many areas of life. And it's like a very acute, okay, you need to learn these skills right now to solve this problem. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does. Very specific person and a very specific, or a very specific thing. Yeah, exactly. I just wanted, I guess, as a point of a clarification in case you're you're pitching to other guys would essentially be like for the stuff that i do i mainly also focus on communication and then the physical and all that other like your physicality mentality all that other stuff is like it's covered kind of generally but not as specific as like communication generally when i'm talking to guys or i'm helping one on one on one it's like a what had what transpired in the situation specifically and then next time the situation occurs, this is the kind of technique to use. I think maybe essentially similar to what you're doing, but not with as much, they're not at zero. So it's like, this happens every now and then kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. Um, I do, I do think it's really cool how there is almost like what, what we do is like, there's so much continuity from what I do to what you do because it sounds like a lot of the communication skills are very similar yeah. and, um, and you just kind of, if I'm like the tip of the iceberg, you're everything underneath. Um, I think that's really cool. Yeah. It's, it's like almost complimentary. I view it as almost like complimentary skill sets. Like if, if you, yeah. the stuff I teach is essentially like safeguards. And if you fall past the mm -hmm. safeguards, then they need the skills you have to like, right. Get back to where you're just running the main. Exactly. Like, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Cause actually, you know, one of my clients uh, that I had, he was close, he, you know, he was uh, receiving divorce threats. Uh, he was, he felt like he was close to divorce and he had, he had the weekly check-in. He had the, the, the weekly date night, mm. you know, like yeah, yeah. he had that process in place. Okay. The, the problem was that he, his, his wife basically wasn't, she came with a lot of issues and she wasn't able to self-reflect and see that what issues she was bringing to the table. 
And the process that I, that I taught him these communication skills, he actually, it got her to see what she, like what her traumas were and how they were acting out and causing conflict in the, in the relationship. So, um, yeah, so sometimes you can have these, this maintenance process in place, but that doesn't mean that you are, you know, safe from the, from the threat of a breakup or of a divorce. Um, Especially if the other party doesn't, or like in, in this case, like isn't able to reflect or, or, uh or see where they have to improve. Yeah. Yeah. That was a really wild, um, that was a really wild experience because this client, like a year over almost a year and a half of divorce threats being like, you know, the fights a couple times a week, I'm going to divorce you. I'm going to take away the kids. I'm going to take the kids, blah, 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 all this stuff. And then to have him, his testimonial, like when he, he, he sent me a voice note back, he was like, our conversation was an absolute revelation. You know, she apologized for the first time for how she was behaving. And actually she said, I should probably go get some therapy because like, I didn't realize I was being like this, but I see how much like I'm, I'm being a problem and, and all these kinds of stuff. And it was just a mind blowing result. Mm to have that have because these techniques they do force contemplation but to have them lead someone to self-contemplate that deeply to where they apologize because the other thing is like this woman was like behaving like a narcissist and most people think that narcissism is this like static thing yeah but but every like her reaction her response to the techniques that I taught him and everything that, you know, we went through f like flew in the face of narcissism. You know, they don't apologize. They don't take responsibility. They don't, they don't say like, I think I should go get therapy. I didn't realize, you know, yeah. they don't, they don't have those kinds of self realizations. So it was, it was really uh, just some, an incredible result. Sounds like it. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of curious now, like, I don't know if you want to share this out loud or not, but like, can you give one of the, um, can you give an example of like what you told him to say in response to something that she would say that maybe forced her to contemplate? If you don't care to share that, that's well, but yeah, yeah, no, I mean, we went through basically the, the listening framework that we've discussed already. What I helped him, what I helped him do was I helped him actually, create like custom uh f phrases that worked for his situation for the stuff that she would say to him um and i also helped design some questions to lead them out of that out of that pattern um you have an example of like one of the questions like, this yeah so i think <laughs> this is really cool. yeah so like one of the questions that i asked him was i mean they were they I think one of the questions that I have people ask is like a blanket and that you can then dive down deeper into like a specific thing for that situation is like, how did we, how did we get to divorce being our only option? Oh, okay. Because, because that's like, that's like a slap in the face on your perspective without slapping you in the face with it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's like, it's like, whoa, I'm, con I'm like treating it as if it's the only option when obviously it's not. Um, or another thing. Yeah. Another, yeah, th this, this one client, they were, they were running a company together. He and his wife were running a company together and she, it was technically her company, but she was helping him strategize. And I mean, he was helping her strategize and like develop the company. Uh -huh. Um, and she didn't like the direction it was going. And so she just wanted to file for bankruptcy on the company without, without like any discussion as to the ramifications of what bankruptcy entails, what it does to your credit, et cetera, all these other things. 
And, uh, and so one of the questions I had him ask was, how did we get to bankruptcy being our only option? Or what are we trying to achieve by declaring bankruptcy? Yeah. Because, be, yeah, because sometimes they think that bank, that they, they think that that decision, whether it's divorce, whether it's bankruptcy, whether it's that, like that thing that they feel squeezed to do. Sometimes they think that like, that's the only option. And it's like, if you really think of, and really when people choose an option, it's because they're trying to solve for a situation. Yeah. But sometimes if you just take a step back and you look at the criteria of that situation, you realize that what you've picked might not be the best solution for those criteria. So, um, so yeah, so it was like just that kind of thing. Um, but really we, we, she had a lot of built up resentment built up. She would accuse, she would blame him for a bunch of stuff, uh, blame him for making her do things that he didn't want to do. And I've actually made a YouTube video about this, uh, saying something similar where he basically, she would blame him for making her do things when he was basically just giving his opinion on what they thought, what he thought they should do on what he thought the best outcome was. And because he was a bit more experienced on the things he was weighing in on, they'd usually go for that. And then she'd say, and then she'd blame him say, I never wanted to do this. You made me do it. And then, uh, it even went like, he was like going crazy because he obviously never meant for that to happen so he actually wrote up he wrote up a piece of paper and said you know it's basically like an affidavit and it said i hereby declare that like i am doing the, making this decision of my own will and i'm not being coerced to do it <laughs> <laughs> and then so she signed it and then six months later she said you made me sign a piece of paper <laughs> so well, that's where the whole like disarming defusing pulling out the emotions that have been swept under the rug is way more important than trying to solve the problem logically which is what he was doing he was like sign the paper you oh, know good. it's on paper i can submit this later yeah yeah you're good then you recognize that you're doing it by your own will and like i'm not making you so if you recognize this then you can't use this against me use it against him right <laughs> uh, it's just once you start operating in the emotional world, like it, it cho totally changes the the game. It's, yeah, it's a different different kind of game to be played. Yeah, that's um that how how did we is it? It's an that's an interesting question because I'm also I'm currently studying NLP right now. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not. Are you familiar with like neuro linguistic programming? I've yeah yeah I know of it. Um, I'm studying a little bit more so because I like how it's going into how to reframe your thoughts. And so if I'm, I believe I can help my guys reframe their thoughts then it's easier for them to handle certain situations. So that, that's why I'm studying it. Oh yeah. And one of the questions sure. is like when someone, um, when someone gets angry, when you are feeling the, the feeling of anger for a situation that happens or maybe recurring, one of the questions that um, is suggested to ask yourself is how do I know to be angry in this situation? If I move some mm -hmm. of the variables around, is it different? Like, let's say I'm getting angry. Uh, someone so uh, is asking me to um, get super pissed. And it's like, well, how do I know to be angry in this situation? Like, if my friend had asked me, like, would I also be pissed? Or like, what's actually going on? It forces you to think about like what's actually going on and gives you a second to res like to pause so you can respond instead of react. Yeah. yeah. So when you had posed that question, also, I was like, oh, that's also pretty interesting. That instead of just asking yourself, you can ask your spouse if necessary, and then. Let's, yeah. Let's them reflect. Like, how did we get to the point? Yeah. That's a good, uh, I guess they'd call it like a pattern interrupt. Is a. <laughs> is, is a yeah. Uh, is it? Um, maybe, because it's, it's, it, it kind of, in a way, it stops this. Because if they've been operating the certain back and forth pattern, I guess, asking how to and putting the. Number one, it's like different, but number two, it puts the. Uh, I guess. The thought on them for how like how did we get here it's like yeah pause for a second and think hmm yeah yeah i guess it could be a pattern interrupt yeah i'm not super versed i just remember reading that so <laughs> barely new reading so, yeah well cool man
Well, that about wraps it up. Thank you all for joining us. Really appreciate it. I, I personally learned a lot of stuff. I have a page, I have pages full of notes from this and uh, it was wonderful to get to know you, Alex. Thank you for sharing not only uh, your knowledge, but also your expertise and experience with the group because it's one thing definitely to read it from a book and to gather it that way or to read it from a blog, et cetera, but to, re to hear it from someone who's actually helped other people execute on this crisis situation and help them solve it, it has been phenomenal. And I've, I've personally learned a lot. So thank you again for the time. I know we kind of went long, but I appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's awesome. Yeah, thanks so much uh, to you as well. I learned a ton from you as well. I'm not a father yet, but um, I will be. Or at least I plan to be. And so I've I've learned a lot from you on uh, on the other side of the coin of 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 the whole relationships thing. Um, actually, taking your your relationship and reaching new heights with it. Uh, you you really know your stuff. And it sounds like you've also had to implement it in your own life. And that's what gives you this whole uh, credibility and authority and uh, ability to make, make, help people make changes in their own life. So it's really awesome that you're doing this. Uh, it's noble, you know, you're keeping families together. And uh, I really, I really wish you a ton of success in this. And, uh, you know, thanks again for, for, for chatting with me for the last almost three hours. <laughs> Likewise, Alice. Thank you very much.